they've been working on this summer. And so we're going to start off with our first presenter is Zach. Do you know how to turn the lights off? Let me put the cat down. Um, okay. Um, <clears throat> out of curiosity, because I know this has been a thing, can, can you see my bookmarks? Is that a thing? Yes. Okay. Um, I don't know how to turn that off, but hopefully it's not too distracting. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm a rising junior majoring in uh, physics and math. And um, this summer, I worked on a machine learning project under the supervision of uh, Yu Hong and Steve. Um, so, I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the, the project as we go. Um, but just as a quick buffer, I've sort of broken this presentation down into hopefully uh, easily digestible sections, um, each building on the sections that came before it. Um, so, you know, let's just jump right oops let's just jump right into it okay so the first or the zeroth section is i guess first introducing the problem so uh, for those that are unfamiliar one of breakthrough listens primary objectives is to um, search for intelligent life outside of earth right so called techno signatures um, the issue is that, is that we don't know where to look so we end up having to blindly scan large portions of the sky in, 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 in the hopes that we find something um, a consequence of these blind searches is that we end up collecting a ton of data right on the order of petabytes per year where a petabyte is equal to a million gigabytes. Um, that number is pretty big. So just to give you a sense of how much data that is, I did the math. Um, every movie in the MCU, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, up to Avengers Endgame, takes up 130 gigabytes if you download the raw 6K footage. So Breakthrough Listen downloads every movie in the MCU about 10,000 times per year, which is a lot of movies, right? So the search for extraterrestrial or the search for intelligent life um, really is just a problem of big data. Uh, the more effective you are at handling these data, uh, the more effective your searches will be. And, and this along with the fact that most of the stuff you pick up in these data are just you know, radio noise emitted from Earth uh, leads me nicely to the next section, uh, computer vision. Um, so this is an example of the type of data we're dealing with, uh, so-called uh, dynamic spectra or, or waterfall plots. Right? Um, the plot you see to the right of your screen is a plot of frequency over time uh, with power represented using color. So you can think of it as like how powerful is the signal at a given frequency channel over time, All right? Now, I want everyone to ask yourself this. Uh, if you were given this data, as you see on the screen now, how would you go about finding anomalies or, or outliers out of all the noise? Right? In, in, in the interest of time, I, I won't you know, give everyone too much time, but uh, most likely what you would say is you, you would look at it and you would go, oh, you know, um, I know noise is supposed to look like this, but you know, I, I see a weird squiggle here or the line looks kind of weird there, or the color seems off on this part, um, and so on and so forth. What you've just subconsciously done is you've made the base assumption to treat this plot as an image before completing the, the, the thing that I just tasked you with. So naturally, when building machine learning models to automate this task for us, um, treating, them, treating the data as images would be you know, a good initial assumption to make. Um, and it turns out that computers are really good at taking images and finding whatever it is you want them to find, right? So Break the Listen has experimented with a ton of these models, what we call computer vision-based models, right? The name is kind of self-explanatory. Um, some of these models include uh, things like convol convolutional neural networks or CNNs, uh, autoencoders, ResNet, et cetera, et cetera. We won't go into what each of these are, but you know, uh, the, the common trait that all these models share is that they treat the data as images, just like you did, uh, I assume, a couple moments ago. Um, so, you know, some of you naturally might be wondering uh, how well did these models perform? So we can evaluate the performance of these models by looking at something called the embedding space, which is just a human interpretable, interpretable uh, representation of how well the model is learning. So the plot you see to the right are examples of this embedding space um, of, I believe, an autoencoder trained on breakthrough listen data. Uh, so a well-performing model will have all the different colors that you see fairly far apart from each other. Uh, but as you can, I hope, see that uh, the colors are quite close together, meaning the model is having a hard time differentiating between the stuff in the data. So this is one of the motivations behind my project. Um, the other is that uh, if we bring back this plot from the previous slide, uh, these data aren't images, right? They're time series, uh, i.e. something that pro uh, progresses over time. Or if we want to be more general, they're sequences. 
So to treat them as an image would be to treat them as something they're not. So let's try and treat them as, as what they are as sequences, right? Using sequence models. Uh, so an example of a sequence, other than what we already mentioned, which are time series, um, are sentences. And it turns out that sentences and time series share a lot of similarities, uh, which is a good thing because uh, this, um, this uh, never before heard of startup called Google has dumped a ton of money into developing high performing sequence models. They can do tasks, excuse me, tasks like, or, um, or tasks specific to sequences like um, language translation in the case of um, Google Translate. Um, in fact, one of the best performing models was pushed out by a team at Google in 2017 called the Transformer. Uh, amazing name, might I add. But uh, it uses an innovative mechanism known as attention. And the title of the paper, Attention, is all you need. Um, so without going into too much de uh, detail, the Transformer, with its attention mechanism, is able to solve two problems that most sequence models faced prior to 2017. Uh, the first is it's able to capture context. So think of it as like if you have a sentence, for example, uh, the big red dog. Uh, if I pick a random word in that sentence, for example, the word dog. I have lots of myths here. I think someone's unmuted, my bad. Uh, anyway, uh, if, if you pick a sentence, let's say the big red dog, and you pick a random word in that sentence, so in this case, I'll use the word dog, um, the, the meaning of that word will depend on both where it is in that sentence, uh, as well as all the other words or what all the other words in the sentence are. So for example, the sentence AJ has a dog and the sentence AJ looks like a dog, both have the word dog, but clearly have different meanings, right? So attention is able to um, capture these contextual relationships, uh, making for more accurate results. So the picture you see on the screen uh, is a representation of these relationships uh, where heavier dependencies are represented by redder shades and vice versa for, for lighter dependencies. Um, another thing that attention is uh, able to do is it allows you to process your data uh, in parallel. So uh, before 2017, uh, sequence models tried to capture those contextual relationships that we just mentioned um, by passing in uh, their data one at a time. So in the example of language translation, uh, since each word had dependencies on the words before it, uh, to capture these dependencies, you had to pass in one word at a time. And you know, obviously, this wasn't a good solution because as computing hardware progressed, uh, these sequence models couldn't keep up. And so the transformer, due to uh, complicated reasons we won't go over, uh, bypasses this and is able to feed in whole sentences at a time, uh, allowing it to make full use of uh, modern computing hardware like GPUs or even TPUs, meaning you can you know, speed up uh, your training time. Uh, so with these motivations in mind, this was the plan. Uh, we train a transformer model on uh, dynamic spectra data, just like the waterfall plots you just saw. And we see if it outperforms those computer vision-based techniques that we just talked about which we suspect it will. Uh, the issue is that we don't have many examples of alien transmissions yet. Um, but so just all, all, all we have is really just a bunch of data with a ton of noise. And we can't just train a model on noise without having some um, quote unquote positive signals in there. Um, so what we do is we artificially inject these signals into some of the data to simulate what we think a techno signature we, uh, or what we think a techno signature would look like. Um, we call the noise the haystack, and we call this the injected signals the needle. So you're trying to find the needle in the haystack. Um, skipping over some, some detail, uh, the fruits of my labor can be found in GitHub. Uh, it's all on there, all in my GitHub repository. Uh, note that the transform model in this uh, repository is a highly unstable build and does need some more fine tuning before it can be um, deployed into the Breakthrough Listen uh, search pipeline. So in other words, more, more work is needed. Um, so to round off my talk, let's talk about some unexplored avenues. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, my work was really just a, a drop in the bucket. Um, I was tasked with experimenting with sequence models like the transformer uh, to see if it'd be a worthwhile uh, avenue to pursue on top of all the computer vision stuff that we've already done. Um, while work is still ongoing, all signs point to yes, which means we have a whole slew of more uh, sophisticated sequence models all of which build upon the core concepts of the base transformer model that we've discussed today. Um, and obviously all of these we want to try out. Uh, some of these examples include the BERT model, which captures bi-directional relationships. So context in both directions, not just one direction. Uh, GPT, which is one of the best generative models on the market right now. 
as well as other things like per per pervasive attention, normalizing flow, attention-based scans. We won't get into what these are, but you know, just so they're there. Uh, so to, to sort of crowdsource this, uh, this, um, this, this machine learning effort, um, Breakthrough Listen has turned to the Kaggle community. So for those that are unaware, Kaggle is the home for data scientists. Uh, they have over 5 million registered users and about 536,000 daily active users. Uh, and Breakthrough Listen is currently hosting a signal search competition on Kaggle, where Kagglers, which are what the people on Kaggle are called, um, are given data similar to what I've described today, and they're tasked with finding these needles among the haystack. And so far, we've already seen some very promising results, and we have plans to potentially reach out to some of them, uh, some of the uh, more high-performing Kagglers, uh, to see if they can help with our, our SETI efforts. Um, so, you know, looking ahead, uh, if you remember nothing from my talk today or from all my previous talks, um, at least remember this. Uh, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence has been a question as, as really as fundamental as the search for the meaning of life. Right? And for so long, this question seems so far out of reach. Um, but now, more than ever, uh, it seems that we have all the tools necessary to answer this question. Uh, we've come a long, war, uh, excuse me, long way uh, to the point where we now have a bunch of ideas and we have a bunch of potential solutions. And, and all that's left is for someone to come along and pull up, put all these things together. Uh, the Kaggle competition is a step in the right direction. Uh, and each of us here working in SETI uh, contribute a just a little bit to the cause. And I'm hopeful that you know, very soon we'll have a, uh, at least a better understanding of our, our place in the universe. Um, so thank you to Yu Hong and Steve for all the technical supervision they've given me, uh, the interns for putting up with my weekly TED Talks and all my lame jokes and really everyone here at the Berkeley team and beyond for providing um, a great summer experience. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Uh, any questions for Zach? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Refresh me. That's <laughs> wow. So I this forgot. No. The weekly dog picture. <laughs> oh no you can post it in slack later <laughs> yeah i'll send it in slack i'm sorry how could i well, i was writing a google doc as we do in our job and uh i noticed very recently the autocomplete became much much smarter and it's amazing actually finding the context in what i've written if i could just hit tab and have the thing written do you know what what technique uh Google Docs is using for kind of their auto completion of context derived. Uh... Uh, they use a model called GPT, which I mentioned, uh, more specifically GPT 3. Uh, so GPT is like the, the base architecture, and GPT is like Google put their own spin on it and they can't reveal it to the public because they have like, you know, conflict of interest. But um, it goes further than just, you know, Google uh, Docs and Google Slides autocomplete. Like if you go on GitHub right now, which is owned by, I think, Microsoft. Um, they have GitHub Copilot, where literally, if you just type in, let's say, a comment and say, I want my code to do this, it'll auto-complete the code for you. And all of those use the GPT um, model architecture. So it really is becoming more and more sophisticated. So the, the, the future for generative models, at least, is, is very bright. Great. Thanks, Zach. Um, we had better move on. And next up, we have Ben and Owen calling in from Ireland. Thanks. Guys, I'll on? just get the slides pulled up here. So in advance, we still have kind of two weeks left, I think, of working mm -hmm. on the project. And it was kind of the week was a bit bedlam. So I don't, our slides aren't as nicely prepared as Zach's, but we'll, we'll do our best. And for anything that comes up, if anyone wants the completed slides, because we have to prepare slides for um, a, a talk we're doing later in the month as well, and documents and GitHubs and stuff like that. If uh, anyone's interested about any of the stuff, uh, yes. shoot either myself or Ben uh, a message. Perfect. Can you can you see that? Yes. Perfect. Cool. So I suppose we'll kick off. So yeah, uh, what the two of us have been doing is basically just dual site study observations using ILOFAR and LOFAR SE. And uh, I suppose in the background we have uh, just this nice picture of the Leviathan, which was the uh, biggest telescope in the world for a time back in the mid 1800s, I think, on the same grounds as where uh, the uh, ILO fire station is, but uh, 
moving swiftly on from that, I suppose, to explain a little bit more about what LOFAR actually is. It is basically a, an array, uh, LOFAR itself. The word is an acronym for the Low Frequency Array, and it's a network of 52 stations. 38 of them in the, are in the Netherlands, and there are 40 more located throughout Europe. And basically what all of these stations do is they form a radio telescope with an approximate collecting area of about 300,000 square meters. And low fire stations have two different antennae. They have the low band antenna and the high band antenna, which can observe in the 10 to 80 millihertz or megahertz, even not millihertz, megahertz range and the uh, 120 to 240 megahertz range respectively. And the great thing about LOFAR is that stations can be used by themselves in what's called local mode, or two or more stations can be networked together if you want to get a, a greater collecting area. So this is just a picture here on the left that I pulled from the Astron website, and Astron are the guys that are responsible for looking after the LOFAR core over in the Netherlands. So basically, our search strategy for looking for extraterrestrials is that we have Observations taking place simultaneously in an ILOFAR, which is whoops, ILOFAR, which is in Burr in Ireland, and then there's LOFAR SE, which is located in Ansel in Sweden. And rather than what is done with the, I suppose, the steerable telescopes like Parks of Green Bank, where you might have maybe, I don't know, three or five or ten minutes and you have a kind of an on-off cadence. Uh, what we do here is that both stations would observe a target for 15 minutes in the 110 to 190 megahertz range. And the target stars that we decided to look at were selected from the test input catalog. And at the start of the summer, we were given a total of 839 stars that would be visible from both stations. And obviously, I suppose our, uh, our most um, obvious goal uh, for this summer was to observe as many of those stars as possible. But unfortunately, scheduling constraints, technical issues, teething problems, and just lots of bad luck, I suppose, uh, kind of got in the way of things. So uh, hopefully in the last few weeks before we give another talk at the Irish National Astronomy, uh, Astronomy Meeting, we uh, might have a little bit more luck. So uh, I'll pass over to Owen here because I know he did a lot of the work on the, uh, the target selector. Yeah, so uh, like Ben said, the, the main goal of the summer was to perform SETI searches, uh, the first in Ireland that I'm aware of anyways, and um, I'm not sure how much SETI searching has uh, gone on with the other low, far, low fires around the world, but um, that was our kind of goal. And in doing that, we kind of all the infrastructure and architecture was there from uh, previous interns and stuff like that. But we kind of, when it came to observations, we were starting from scratch ourselves and just getting kind of used to the system. So I think the first the first thing of business and kind of what was ongoing uh, throughout summer was like, what, what targets do we select? Especially because it's dual site, there's that uh, implication of uh, visibility of both sites and just, you know, resolution, so on and so forth. So I think getting that um, a big part of the project that really helped streamline it was getting kind of scripts that did everything quite well and you know accounted for time zone differences um that it was very easy that on the days that we could observe we definitely got the the correct targets so i think that was a big part of um, the success we've had with the actual observations that we've done so the script was developed that you just threw it in um a date and time of the window and the duration um i went over this really in depth last week so only i'll only cover it briefly this week but then the the script shows a target based on uh, the relative position to the zenith of both stations um, so low far, uh, I low far and low far SE in this case, and um, the target separation from both the sun and the moon, and then any altitude constraints that would put the target um, in like obstruct it in the field of view at both stations at any time throughout that observation window. Um, it outputted a text file and CSV detailing uh, like the suitable targets for that window and like in, in a format that um, we could give it to the guys in Sweden uh, and they could put it into I, I Lisa pretty handily and uh, perform the observations. And it, it, uh, by the end of it, then we had that we have the system sort of set up that like um, you just throw in the date and you throw in the observation window duration of it and it just throws back out targets and it's, it's worked pretty well so far all summer we've, we've had no issues with that so I think that was a pretty good achievement just even for starting off observations this summer. Uh, if you throw on the next slide there Ben. Oh, so these are just some of the um, I showed these last week as well, but these are some of the um, plots that come out of the target selector just basically when we choose the targets it automatically does it but then it throws out a bunch of plots just so we can check everything by eye so as you can see just the um as, as the target throughout throughout the observation window obviously the target moves position uh, in the sky relative to both stations so we can check that on altitude and the azimuth as well and that's in degrees so we can just see that is it too close to the sun at any points and is there anything kind of funky going on just to make sure that when we do observe we're not kind of 
staring at the sun and getting kind of just a lot of noise back and, and wasting uh, useful observation time. So that was a big priority. I throw on the next one. And then this is just another plot. Just this was kind of another thing that got plotted next to it that just showed that for any point where uh, the purple is, or that constraint is met. So in this one, on, on this particular day, for this particular target, um, for the start of that observation window, it was too close to the sun for us to actually observe. And uh, throw on the next slide. So I think uh, when we've given talks or we've talked to other people about it as well, I think showing our progress and especially when we're trying to get observation windows, showing our progress and kind of where um, where kind of the bulk of the test targets lie was quite important. So here's just a, again that again, uh, the histogram to the left just shows kind of what times of the day in terms of uh, right ascension hours that we kind of need. So we got a lot of our, our usual windows from about seven to 10 in the morning uh, UTC. So you've got a lot of targets observed there from zero to 10 and then a couple there on the 24 mark. And then it's very kind of, there's very little to none uh, kind of from 10 onwards. And then on the right hand side is uh, just a projection of the targets in comparison to the catalog as a whole. So it just kind of gives a good idea of what part of the sky we've been looking at and observing for uh, both the dual site observations. You throw the next slide, Ben. And then the data processing was a big part of it as well. Um, so that was actually kind of the most tedious part and took up an awful lot of time. It was very finicky and there was a lot of updating and, and um, streamlining stuff. So um, it's control simultaneously using ILISA, uh, which was uh, developed by David McKenna and uh, Tobaya, I'm not even gonna try and butcher his last name, um, who developed it all in house. So David's a PhD student here. And I'm not actually quite sure of uh, Tobaya's credentials but he's based in Sweden, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, all those observations were done through them. So we give them a text file and then they do the observations and then we do all the data processing. So we used a singularity, of, a variation of singularity, uh, a singular, singularity uh, image uh, developed by David called LOFAR UDP Guppy Raw. And that created uh, 2,682 2, raw files for each observation. And then we used raw spec to turn those into filter banks and ultimately um, run turbo SETI and um, all, all the good stuff on it for actual SETI searches after that. And, and the processing time for, for running that stuff uh, was approximately 20 minutes for the raw spec, raw spec. And then it was, it varied greatly depending on actually getting the raw data in. So I think all in all, it was maybe a, a depending on the station because it was different, uh, different computational powers. It took maybe 30, 40 minutes per target, I think, to get the processing done. I don't know, Ben, you want to contradict me on, on those numbers, but I think it was in around that. Yeah, I suppose it would kind of vary, but uh, I think after, I know David updated the singularity image uh, there, and I think that definitely sped things up. So I think usually on a good day anyway, um, yeah, I think using UDP Guppy Raw would take about 15 minutes and then raw spec, if it just flies through, it takes about five. But uh, yeah, I suppose there is a bit of variation uh, your mileage may vary would probably be a, a good caveat to, to throw in there at the, the end of that. Uh, do you um, want to take this slide? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it wasn't without its challenges trying to do all of that data processing. Like uh, Zach said in his uh, presentation, I suppose one of the biggest issues that we have in trying to find uh, intelligent life out there in the universe is it's basically become a problem of big data and 15 minute observations produce fairly large filter bank files, which are about 135 gigs. And unfortunately, there's only a 97.612796 gigabytes of RAM available on each of the low fire compute nodes. Uh, I got that figure by just checking how much RAM was available on each of the stations. And I say only because I suppose to, I suppose any normal person, 97 gigs of RAM sounds absolutely outrageous. But uh, unfortunately, that's the, uh, the nature of uh, what we're dealing with. And even with uh, the max load option available in Blimpy, we'd nearly need another 40 gigs of RAM to be able to load the filter bank files into the memory in order to create waterfall plots. And therefore, we uh, developed a utility called Styx with uh, Richard Elkins. Uh, I think I saw his name in the participants list. So big shout out to Richard. He's been a great help with developing all of this. And it's uh, definitely made life a lot easier for us. So uh, basically what it does is it splits the... Uh, I suppose uh, the filter bank file that would be, I suppose, too big to load in on its own, it would split it into a number of chunks. And then for each of these chunks, it would generate a separate uh, a separate waterfall plot. And ever since version 2.0.20, 2 
Blimpy now contains sticks as standard, and I've managed to te test it, and it works fine on low fire C. But unfortunately, I low fire is down at the moment, so hopefully we'll be able to test that ASAP. I have a few examples here. It's probably a bit small to be able to see them, but uh, the top one here is the data that I got from the Open Data Archive. This is Omoomua, and then these two here are two different targets that we got in Sweden. So obviously, if we're able to compare these waterfall plots between Ireland and the Irish and Swedish stations, it would make things a lot easier, I'd say, in terms of being able to take a finer look at things and maybe reject any uh, signals that might not show up in one or other of the, uh, the two locations. So, yeah, I suppose uh, we did have uh, plenty of initial goals. Um, Carrying on from previous interns, uh, I know Charlie was one of the main interns that we we did a lot of uh, work carrying on from what he did last year, uh, uh, getting a pipeline up and running for dual site SETI observations. And we uh, we had a look at Turbo SETI and Blimpy in a low fire specific context and trying to maybe see was there any way that we could modify those to uh, optimize them for low fire rather than, I suppose, uh, they're designed primarily with uh, steerable telescopes in mind. So was there any tweaks we could make there? that would make them uh, a bit more useful or just make our lives a little bit easier. And to write up a bit of documentation uh, describing how the how do we perform SETI searches using the low-fire stations, including data processing and sorting that I, uh, I mentioned already. Uh, again, what Owen was doing with the dual site target selector and complete the first successful SETI searches from both stations. And our initial goal was to survey 100 plus test targets. Uh, unfortunately, data that target definitely slipped a lot with uh, the way things have gone in terms of just not having telescope time due to, I suppose there was a solar team that needed the telescope for two weeks. And then the BLC00 backend has been, I don't know, inaccessible for the last couple of weeks. So unfortunately uh, we have had a few issues there. Um, but I suppose, um, yeah, uh, we pretty much accomplished everything else. So I suppose it's not bad in the grand scheme of things, but uh, I suppose our, our main objective now would be to hopefully get a few more observations in before uh, we wrap up in uh, a few weeks' time. Yeah, we're hoping to maybe double the numbers. And I think I think that we the fact that we got most of the other stuff done, um, I feel like we had a lot of hiccups and it was, it was just a big teething process, but I think it's because it's the first summer that kind of these types of observations have taken place. I guess that was expected. And um, I guess at the end of the day, that's kind of science. If it's not like, if it works first time, uh, it's not work, like it doesn't actually work properly. So I, th I think trial and error was a big part of it. And I think uh, me and Ben both learned that and that just research and, and this kind of um, astronomy definitely um, is very satisfying, but it, it does take its toll and it does, um, it, it is very rewarding when it does pay off. So like we, uh, like I said at the start, we've kind of got two weeks left now. So uh, I think it's till the 27th or so we wrap up. So hopefully we'll still get um, ILO far up and running this week. I think they said in the emails, the maintenance guys. So hopefully we'll get maybe another 25 targets if we're going good. Um, fingers crossed, maybe we'll be able to swing an extra observation window or two since we've kind of lost a month and a bit of uh, observing time. Um, investigate the possibility of modifying turbo SETI is fine with uh, channel width, which we've been discussing with Richard and uh, Evan and just how to kind of maybe what's the best way to do it for filter banks and stuff like that. Um, getting turbo SETI and Blimpy to work with GPUs at the low fire stations, which I think they are at the moment, or they are in Sweden anyways. And I think it's only once the, the Irish stations back up, it'll just be a case of making sure everything's up to date and getting that working and um, get some interesting yeah, results uh, to put into a paper with uh, Vishal uh, et al, which is we're in the process of writing at the moment as well. Um, so other, other than that, um, thank you guys so much for, I guess, having us. Um, this this program has made me completely fall back in love with physics. I was kind of at my wits end with it uh, as it came to the end of my third year. Uh, just, you know, too many, exam too many exams and uh, too many kind of rigorous labs and stuff like this. So I'm, I'm absolutely enamored with the subject again, and I'm definitely going to pursue a, a postgrad either in uh, radio astronomy or, or something kind of in, in around this field and I'm, I'm super excited to see where SETI goes especially in the next couple of years and um, it's definitely going to go, go far because uh, with, with the other interns uh, I've seen crazy crazy amount of intellect and intelligence and just just some of the way uh, you guys solve problems is crazy to me I, I, I can't believe uh, some of the solutions you guys have come up to with for uh, problems that just boggle my mind completely so uh, best of luck to everyone uh, in the coming weeks and uh, Ben if you anything to say 
Yeah, absolutely. I suppose just to kind of echo what you said there, like I mean, at each of these kind of show and tell sessions, you'd see how, how creative people can be when it comes to just solving little problems. And it's just little bits of ingenuity that just, you'd kind of just, you'd be just so shocked by them. You'd be like, wow, that's really incredible. How, how did you even think of that? Like, I mean, I never would have thought about solving it that way. It's just so, so clever. And it's just what's so great about these kind of uh, internships and you get the uh, kind of a uh, bit of dialogue there and it just, uh, yeah, it, it's just kind of the uh, the whole idea of working together, and it just it's just it's just great, and it's it's what makes physics and astronomy so interesting, you know. Uh, I mean, results are only fun when you have them to share with other people. So yeah, absolutely, collaboration is the name of the game, and it has been a pleasure collaborating with everyone over the summer. So thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Um, our external evaluator, Julie Shattuck, is on the call, and I hope she grabbed a couple of those quotes for our report to the National Science Foundation. <laughs> Maybe fall back in love with physics, I think, is uh, kind of what we're going for. So um, that's fantastic. You, you have uh, no proof? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. Thanks, guys. Uh, any questions um, for Ben and Owen? Results from the two sites. Are you seeing the difference that differ slightly because each site has slightly different um, contributions to the drift from the location? Someone repeat that. I just I didn't really. Yeah, I couldn't really sense. hear that. Comparing the two sites, are you seeing different drift rates because uh, of the different locations of the two sites? Yeah, I think there is different drift. Well, well the, the we haven't fully. So the problem is that we don't have access to some of the observations. So we're kind of in the middle of comparing them right as we were kind of starting that process right when um the irish station went down i think i think on our initial looks there was different drift rates but it was kind of one of those things that we haven't got a chance to explore and we're hoping uh monday tuesday that's kind of where the the guts of our um our work lies now is actually in comparing the two so we kind of got everything done the observations were run automatically and then the last two weeks are kind of uh looking at, at everything from drift rates and, and all the really nitty-gritty stuff that uh, turbo study does so i i don't have a full answer to that question at the moment and that's just that's just for pure lack of i don't have access to any of the observations and we kind of got caught up cut off very middle middle of the process i don't know if you have anything to add to that ben yeah no I, i'd agree like i said just kind of keeping an eye on turbo SETI when it was running uh just kind of eyeballing things you would see that there was a slight difference um i mean again i think there was some funny ones that would like some outlandish drift rates so you'd be kind of like oh that's a bit weird so again, we're uh, we're just going to have to have a look at things when, fingers crossed, I think it's the 17th or 18th, they said the Irish station will be back. So fingers crossed for them that we will uh, we'll be back up and running. So uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have lots to, uh, lots to talk about. Well, I want to thank you guys for presenting, um, even though you're not fully done with your project yet. Uh, I thought that was great. Um, and I also want to thank you for just calling in at crazy hours from Ireland, even when we've had sort of things like today. I really appreciate your, you spending uh, you know, your evenings with us um, this this summer. So um, and I hope you get a chance to come out and see us in both of you sometime. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be great. And it's, it's, it's really awesome to work. Like, yeah, yeah it, it's really awesome to work with you guys, uh, especially I think it's crazy that we're in Ireland and, and working all this really cool uh, astronomy space stuff and searching for little green men, uh, you know, and completely different parts of the parts of the world. So uh, th thanks, guys, again. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Been a pleasure. Let's move on. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying it's it's been a pleasure. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks. All right, great. Let's move on. Uh, next up is Rafi. Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. I'll go like this so you can't see. It. Okay. Um, share my screen. Okay. So um, my name's Rafi. I go to a school in uh, Wisconsin. Uh, in La Crosse, it's kind of on the Mississippi River. Um, I'm going to be a senior this year. Um, yeah, so my project this uh, this summer was working on uh, radio technosignature searches of nearby galaxies. Um, that's the main goal of the project. And so the, the project was split into three things, um, where I wanted to we wanted to identify we wanted to observe all the galaxies in our uh, sample from the Regulus and initial target list. And then we also wanted to we wanted to perform a candidate search on them, and then we wanted to also uh, quantify Turbo SETI performance. And we'll go over all of those in this presentation. 
so the first part is the galaxy sample distribution. Um, the initial uh, break the list and target list had 123 galaxies. And it was a morphological type complete sample as well. Um, and But the GBT only observes 97 of them because it's limited to targets with a declin declination above negative 20 degrees. Um, and so, yeah, this is just shows the locations of all of these uh, targets. Um, and also this, uh, this table shows the distribution of them. So, uh, yeah, so, oh, where did the mouse go? Oh, there it went. Okay, so, but we, observations were already underway of these targets before the start of this project. So we needed to identify those that uh, had yet to be observed. And we had, we actually planned to complete observations of the entire galaxy sample, uh, but there are only five observations remaining. So that's, that's good. Uh, but so we actually did this by adding a priority to the target queuing system uh, at the, at the Green Bank Telescope. Um, we just added them to a script where they have like this condition where instead of uh, slewing to a source that like the closest one, may, if there's a galaxy, um, or if, it, if there's a target with a high priority, then just go to that one. Um, and so that's how we've been um, getting these observations done. And so that's a cool new feature um, of this project. But, and then, so this is the, so once we acquire the data, we have to process the data. Um, but it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, I had never worked, it, it poses an interesting challenge because I've never worked on a, in a place where um, when you process the data, it can be, so I worked at, I, last time I worked with um, uh, Google Cloud, directly in Google Cloud, and all the data was just mounted there. And it was just like, it was very uh, simple. This is a little more, bit more interesting. I think um, uh, Noah will be able to have a really good uh, explanation of how we did this, but um, we ended up using a, a SQL database to um, find the locations of those filter bank files um, that were stored somewhere at the Green Bank Observatory. And, and then, so then we, we, oh, I have three lists twice. That's funny. So that's supposed to be a two under process. So process, so then we process the data and um, we read the SQL database and uh, Noah has this cool program that distributes turbo SETI processes uh, across the compute nodes at the Green Bank uh, Observatory. And then um, it just runs turbo SETI on those files. Um, and then the part that, uh, that I've been working on um, is just creating scripts that uh, can run find events and plot events uh, to actually find candidate events um, on these nodes because they're not all in one directory anymore. So it, it's kind of a fun challenge, but, and it's going well. Um, the only problem is, is that um, I don't have a lot of, in terms of how he hasn't been run on a like, a significant portion of them, but it has been run and there are some uh, prelim preliminary candidates. These are filter three event candidates. So these are ones where there shouldn't be anything in the offs, but um, either there is clearly things in the off um, or it's just a weird kind of thing where uh, kind of an aberrant, like the middle one, the middle one here, it's kind of strange because you're not really seeing any uh, continuous signal. It's just, just met Turbosetti's, uh, uh, the find event uh, conditions for a candidate event. Um, but yeah, so these are three of the ones that I have right now. I think I have uh, run Turbosetti on at least, at least like um, 15 cadences, which isn't a whole lot, but I've been finding all of the other cadences, um, which are, yeah, I've been finding all the other cadences. So um, the SQL database will be getting larger. And so um, once I find all of those, it'll be really easy just to just to go through them all. Um, yes. And then, so the next, the last part of the uh, project was the efficiency testing. And so this is, this had already actually been done before by a previous intern, but um, their parameters used 40 hertz, 40 hertz with signals. Um, but we wanted to see, um, four hertz with signals instead, so more narrow band. And so we wanted to quantify um, its efficiency, how many, yeah, its efficiency at finding signals uh, as a function of drift rate and signal intensity. 
Uh, and then we, for that, we use signal injection and recovery methods. And for that, we use a, um, I think, uh, I just mentioned before, but uh, the artificial signal uh, creation and injection method that we have is brought to, uh, is produced by a SETI gen. And so we have um, a pre-injection filter bank file, and then we inject a signal using SETI gen, and then we run turbo SETI on this, on this newly injected file and see if it finds all of the signals that we inject. We can inject like multiple ones or um, all these different drift rates and such, but we stuck to constantly drifting uh, signals and uh, one signal per um, iteration. Uh, yes, and so this is the results for the detection efficiency by the drift rate. Uh, as you can see, it's kind of it's, uh, normal almost, but um, so we had injection parameters. So we in, so we I injected uh, what is it called signals with a drift rate of from negative ten to ten hertz per second, and I did so, and then I iterated through each drift for each drift rate I ran and I injected and recovered signals um, five uh, I think it's like fifty thousand times per drift rate, um, and these are the results of that. Um, so the injected signal always uh, had a SNR of uh, 30 and a width of four. Um, and so these are the results of the drift rate. It's kind of surprising because um, it's so high. Uh, you see the lowest tick on the y-axis is uh, 95%, uh, which is, um, yeah, which is really, really cool. Um, so this is, this is for signal noise. There is some strange behavior, but we also saw this behavior going on in the previous interns. So this isn't totally unexpected, but I, I'm not really sure what to make of it. Um, but for these, we uh, I injected a drift rate, a constant drift rate of just zero and uh, signal to noise from uh, 0.5 to 100. And for each iteration, uh, for each uh, signal to noise ratio, I injected signals and recovered them uh, 10,000 times. And uh, this, these were all for all these signal injections were performed on um, uh, what's it called uh, GCP uh, um, Google uh, oh goodness words today but anyways um, so they were all done in, in using Google Cloud uh, computing and so um, yeah so this kind of makes sense since I think the default Turbo SETI SNR is like 10 or 15. So that makes sense why we are not seeing anything in, in like, these are binned on 10 Hertz, uh, 10 SNR wide bins. Uh, so it makes sense why we're only starting to see things at 15, but this behavior is, was, yeah. So we also saw this behavior, as I said, in the previous interns. Um, so yes, um, the next steps for me, I guess, are documenting all of the um, code that I used in, in data processing as well as the signal injection um, and finish processing the data, uh, Turbo SETI, uh, finding, storing them and processing them, and then just write up the results as well. Are there any questions? Thanks, Rafi. Uh, questions? So I just had a quick comment um, regarding your SNR, uh, yeah. you know, that, that strange behavior where it's going up a little bit. And I suspect it's actually just that the injection is actually skewing your estimates of the background noise because, um, you know, oh. you've got some, uh, you know, so it's probably not approximating Gaussian if you've got a lot of plugs that's in there. So we, we should sort of dig into that a little bit more, maybe get some more robust estimators for the background. Mm, okay. Any other comments or questions? Uh, all right, thanks, Rafi. Um, so we'll go now uh, live and here in the room uh, to Noah. Share your screen. Share your screen, and then you, hopefully the, the sound will pick up. But speak uh, speak clearly. All right, so uh, my slides aren't as pretty as everyone else's. Uh, I realized that after watching them, but uh, I'm Noah. I'm, I go to Siena College in upstate New York, and 
this is my presentation on techno signature search, uh, a techno signature search of transiting test targets of interest. And so recently, TESS has uh, discovered many new exoplanets. And as a result, there have been uh, recent studies by Breakthrough Listen at Green Bank Telescope of test targets. And so the goal of this, uh, this project was to kind of narrow this search to only tar test targets that transit during their observation. And this is because for these ex exoplanets, like from their perspective, Earth is in their ecliptic. And so extraterrestrial life on those exoplanets may assume that we are watching them during their transit and uh, are more likely to transmit a signal, which means we're more likely to get a detection. So to select these targets, uh, I cross-matched the uh, Green Bank Telescope test observations with the uh, test target of interest catalog and found uh, 61 targets that are labeled on this, uh, this sky map plot here. Uh, as with the red X's and the blue dots are all the test target targets of interest. And these 61 targets were across 66 observations. Uh, and as a uh, as a quick check, we I also plotted up the Green Bank Telescope observing zone here, so you can see that all of uh, my targets are in fact in the observing zone. <laughs> um, and so to observe these targets, we uh, use the classic Green Bank on off cadence. So we have uh, six observations uh, A, B, in the pattern of A, B, A, C, A, B, where A is an on target and B, C, and D are off targets. So it was then interesting to plot the what we've been calling the fraction of transit observed. And this is a metric that describes how much of, how much of each transit uh, we are observing. And so uh, for an example, some targets may, uh, you may obs start observing them right before their transit or during the transit, and then they finish after, like we finish observing after they finish transiting. So uh, to calculate this, we did the uh, time that the target is, time that we are observing the target during its transit, divided by the total transit time, which we found is doing the egress minus the ingress. Uh, this is plotted up here on the left with the number of cadences on the left axis, and then the fraction of transit observed on the uh, x axis. And the hashes, the hash bins here, are the ones that are that cross their the midpoint of the transit during the observation, which are especially interesting because if you think of a a transmitter always pointed in Earth's direction as an exit or always away from the host star as the exoplanet is uh, going around the, the star, then as the target as the target crosses its midpoint, the signal will be strongest pointing at Earth. So we can look for this and uh, theoretically it should be a Gaussian distribution where like it's weaker on both sides of the midpoint. So uh, to analyze all this data, we first had to find all the data and with the help of Matt, we were able to do that. Uh, and there was about uh, more than 30 terabytes of telescope data. So we followed the general, uh, like the normal pipeline uh, with Turbo SETI. So we uh, inputted the telescope data into a fine Doppler, which returns hits or any signals, of, any signals in the data. And then use the find event pipeline to compare across the on and off observations to return events, which is any, uh, with a threshold of three, which is what I used, is any uh, on any signal that is in only the on observations and not in the off observations. And so then, as Rafi mentioned, I also modified this th process this summer by uh, running Turbo Study across all 64 compute nodes, which I called uh, multi turbo. Uh, it's in this GitHub at the bottom here, but just to quickly go over what it does with 30 terabytes of data, uh, it was expected. Uh, like about six weeks to run uh, through Turbo Study, which I did not have time for because I think I started running around the fifth week. Um, but at Green Bank, we have 64 compute nodes. So uh, uh, we thought like, why can't we just run this across all 64 compute nodes in parallel? There is one issue that Turbo Study can't be run during the Green Bank observation. So to account for this, we recorded, once a file finished running through Turbo Study, we recorded it in a SQL database and then queried that database every time we started the script up again to 
for only uh, targets that have been run, that have not been run through Turbo Study. And this way we're not like double, double running uh, files through Turbo Study. So then some of the results of this Doppler drift search are here. Uh, these two waterfall plots are both of the same target. And uh, these are just some interesting ones we found. We ended up with uh, about 630 events, but these ones are interesting because it seems at first glance that the signal is, while it is wideband is present in only, basically only the on observations, except uh, they can then be eliminated if you look at this last off observation, there's some signals present in both of them. In addition, uh, as I mentioned, the signals are wideband and we're, we're looking for narrow band signals. So for, the, for both these reasons, these can be eliminated as candidates. Uh, three more interesting plots. The one on the left here, uh, I simply found interesting because it, it almost looks like a signal is like splitting halfway through. And after further investigation, it seems like it's actually just two signals with uh, slightly different drift rates that cross uh, just before this first observation. Also, all the signals are present in both the on and the off observation, so it clearly is not a, uh, a candidate. The middle plot here is of the, uh, one of the targets that crosses its midpoint during the observation. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, that's especially interesting, so I thought I'd just put one up here. But as you can see, this is probably just RFI as it is in all of the on and the off observations. And then the last plot, uh, is very interesting because it has a changing Doppler shift. So the, the signal, the, the, the angle of the signal changes as it goes down. And uh, this is expected for a satellite, but for a satellite, you'd also expect it to only be in a couple of the observations because they usually like transit, transit across the telescope and then disappear. But as you can see, it's in every one. And this can be explained uh, just as a slow moving satellite probably. So after realizing we didn't uh, have any candidates, uh, we looked at the signal distribution of the hits in the events, and that's plotted up on the right here with the y-axis as the number of hits or events and the x-axis as the frequency. The uh, lighter gray boxes in the background are the hits and the black bins are the events. And each of the other overlaid colors are the uh, green bank receivers. Uh, in the table here, the, it also lists the frequency ranges for each of these receivers and the number of cadences in each or at each receiver. Uh, this I just want to point out here that we have very few cadences at L band and fairly equal uh, across the rest of them. So that partly explains why there's so few uh, events and or so few hits at L band. And so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, had, we have 630 total events and uh, about 2.5 million total hits. Another interesting, uh, or some other interesting plots to look at are the, uh, the number of hits or events versus the drift rate and versus the signal noise ratio. And both of these are as expected, uh, with the drift rate being almost Gaussian like around the uh, zero drift rate, uh, and the signal and noise with a lot more signals. Are fairly even distributed, evenly distributed throughout, and a lot more signals and events at low signal noise ratios. In addition, we did a transmitter rate comparison to other studies, and quickly, transmitter rate is essentially the likelihood of detecting an extraterrestrial signal. So close to the top, like the, the higher up on the y-axis towards zero, uh, this is where like extraterrestrial signals are very common. Whereas down here towards negative 10 uh, is where extraterrestrial signals are very rare. And then the EIRP, this is plotted against the EIRP or the equivalent isotropic radiated power, which is essentially, if you imagine a fictional antenna on a, a distant exoplanet, it's uh, the a power measurement. It's the power that that antenna would have to have for us to uh, detect it. And so for this study, we're at the, these Y-shaped points right here, and a bunch of other studies are plotted against. And as you can see, we're, we're fairly similar to the, the recent studies. So in conclusion, uh, we did not discover any extraterrestrial signals, sadly, 
Uh, but because of that null result, we're able to set the following transmitter limits, uh, which are which is the maximum probability that a uh, transmitter exists on one of these uh, exoplanets that we observed. So for L band, it's 52%, C it's 16%, S is 20%, and X is 15%. And I just want to point out L is so high because of the few number of cadences that we had at that, at that receiver. So three future studies are uh, studying targets that are entering or exiting their secondary transit, which could be interesting because the, the, a signal from the exoplanet will uh, disappear as it goes behind the star. Uh, starting or studying targets that enter or exit their primary transit, which may not be as interesting, but again, uh, like I said in the beginning, if the if extraterrestrial life knows that we're paying attention, they may know to send out an odd signal when they start their transit. And then finally, uh, digging more into targets that cross their transit midpoint, um, as I explained at the beginning, is very interesting. Thank you. Great, thanks, Noah. Um, any questions for Noah? Uh, I have a question. How did you calculate these transmitter limits? All right, I'm going to try to get this right. Um, we did a, we took the maximum value of a one-sided binomial confidence level of 95% with a 50% uh, probability that if a transfer exists, we detect it. So basically, like we use some very weird statistics. <laughs> I think they're the right statistics. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it's it's just you know you roll you roll a dice or flip a coin or whatever you know a certain number of times and uh, you know in this case there were five observations at Elban. What are the chances that there are transmitters out there that we missed? Basically, yeah. which is yeah. Another question for you on your fraction of transit. Yeah. If you look at how many hours you observe test targets and how many hours you calculate to observe planets in transit, does it make sense like overall like the, the fraction? Because transits are out are order of hours, orbits are order of days. So I, I was surprised that you had so many so many targets that were observed in transit. Does the overall fraction kind of make sense if it's a uh, fraction of time in transit versus overall observed? Well, I'm kind of confused. It, 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 maybe I can kind of clarify. So um, for, for this plot, this is four targets that we know are transiting already. So that's a, a fairly small fraction of the overall number of test targets that we've observed at Green Bay. And I think you did that calculation, kind of the calculation that Howard's suggesting early on in the summer I to did, make yeah. sure that that number looked right. And I think it was, it was about, if I remember correctly, I think it was less than 5% of test right. targets that, yeah, which, which we were like, and, and then for this plot, it's like, okay, we know that we have, you know, twiddles 100 targets that are transiting, and for those, how much of the transit that we get, and it's sort of, I don't know, I guess it, it, it peaks around a small fraction of the transit, and that's probably the fact that the transit is hours and the observations are 30 minutes. So. Yeah. And uh, we, for a significant number of them, we just happen to, like, I, I think it's like around 10 or 15, we just happen to, like, start observing right before, or like right before the, right before it starts, right before the end. So that's why there, you see a lot more around like four numbers too, like around point one. Oh, cool. Yeah. They all happen before the summer. Okay. It's just like observations that of test targets that happen to occur during transit. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's serendipitous. I mean, yeah. we could go back and do you know actually try and schedule them during transits, but obviously that's a little bit more challenging. And we do that through processing. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks, Noah. Uh, let's move on. And next up is Malik. All right. So, hello, everyone. My name is Malik Masset. I am a um, rising third year at Northern Arizona University. I am studying astronomy with a concentration in astrophysics. And um, my project that I did over the summer was the imperial classification of nearby stars and toric spectral line mapping. So kind of like an introduction, the uh, stellar spectra are actually a pretty important part in the search for extraterrestrial life. Um, so when looking at 
um, certain stellar spectra, if, if there happened to be extraterrestrial civilization on an exoplanet orbiting, orbiting that star, uh, we could actually use that stellar spectra to see if there are any, uh, any laser emission lines coming from, you know, coming from uh, potential extraterrestrial lasers that that civilization might be using. And those laser emission lines may show up on the stellar spectra that we are, that we are studying. So what uh, to work uh, in order to in order to find these kind of laser emission lines, we have to look out for uh, toric lines. So toric lines are are pretty much lines that show atmospheric interference uh, with stellar spectra. So they could be from uh, they could be from elements within the Earth's atmosphere or from uh, elements from the Earth's surface. So for example, with this um, with this uh, graph, it shows two sodium uh, uh, emission features. Um, this is actually data taken from the Automated Planet Finder uh, at WIP Observatory. And um, this can actually be a false positive because these are actually sodium emission lines coming from the city of San Jose, which uses uh, low sodium, uh, it's low energy uh, yellow sodium lights. So these two arc lines can show, these two arc lines can show up as false positives. And we may think they're from extraterrestrial origin, but they're actually from earthly origin. So we want to make sure uh, that we want to, we want to correct for that. We want to correct for, um, correct for that. So I guess getting, uh, in order to, I guess like in the process of, um, of getting to, getting to that, um, kind of like during the first, uh, second week, uh, for the first or second week of uh, the internship, I created a tutorial on GitHub that shows how to um, deblaze and normalize spectra in order to more easily try to find these candidate laser emission lines and look out for false positives. And normalizing the spectra can actually help in reducing any variation uh, between potential, between potential um, actual stretch laser emission lines or uh, to our line features. Um, so here's the, this is the link to the mm -hmm. tutorial right here. And then another vital part of this uh, of this project was um, using data from uh, Spectrum IGMP. So it's pretty much a it's pretty much a library that consists of um, that consists of uh, many solar, solar spectra taken with the high res instrument on the Keck telescope, um, and uh, I basically used uh, this data to um, to help in finding any candid uh, laser emission lines. Um, I was also going to use this uh, Python program called Telfit, which actually helps in um, modeling and fitting toward absorption spectra uh, into astronomical data. And what it effectively does, it, remo it removes the toward absorption features uh, from uh, from uh, optical stellar spectra uh, taken from any taken from any telescopes. You can see on the left, um, this graph was from a paper that uh, that model Telfit. So on the left, uh, it shows the graph. It show it actually shows a graph um, showing the toric uh, toric interference, and then on the right, it shows a graph uh, where the toric interference is corrected. So. Um, this was actually going to be a vital tool for this project, but unfortunately, me and my mentor kind of like ran into some issues trying to download it onto the data center. So um, unfortunately, we couldn't use this tool. So we came up with another came up with another um, idea. So uh, we decided we were going to use data from the Automated Planet Finder and Keck to pretty much compare to uh, pretty much compare them and see if <clears throat> and and pretty much uh, make sure that the make sure that the data from the two telescopes from uh, comparing stellar, sp stellar spectra from one star um, were correct. So um, on the left we have the Keck um, the raw Keck spectrum from a specific star HIP 
3093. And then on the right, we have the APF, uh, raw APF spectrum. Uh, and then from there, I basically combined both of those, I combined both of those graphs together. Um, I found the area where the graphs overlap um, to make sure that there aren't any systematic errors between the two graphs, which will make it easier for me to uh, potentially find uh, potentially find laser emission lines. And then I also normalized the data as normalized the data as well um, in order to also in order to also correct for any uh, systematic variation. Um, so on the left, on the left is the blue. Is, is on the left uh, is Hex normalized data, and then on the right is APS normalized data. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, I said uh, I wanted to interpolate this data. So by interpolating, it basically means putting one putting one data set <laughs> over another. So pretty much, it's putting it's uh, at least from this um, example is placing um, the new Keck wavelength array over the APF wavelength array. And then from there, um, I was able to see from the, from the bottom graph that both, of, uh, both observations line up for the most part. It's a, little bit, it's a little bit off, but for the most part, the observations line up. So in that way, um, I would be able to, um, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be more able to um, figure out from these two observations if there were any um, any laser line emissions. So, uh, concluding uh, using these interpolated plots can actually help in finding um, candidate laser line emissions uh, by confirming by confirming that both uh, both observations uh, observed stellar spectra uh, from different telescopes. Uh, are uh, basically are correct, or at least in um, so that that way we won't have um, we won't have to work uh, spectra interfering. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Howard and uh, Anna for providing the data I needed to conduct this research. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Zoe and um, another guy named uh, Hay. For, um, for helping me and creating my uh, tutorial. Uh, All right. Thanks, Malik. Uh, any questions for Malik? Uh, I have a question. Um, so when you're talking about, you know, laying the two spectra on top of each other and then you can find uh, Solaric lines, right? Because there would be, would they be present in one but not the other? Right? Um, well, they would at least they when putting when putting both of them together, um, it was basically in it was basically in the sense confirming that um, both were both are able to avoid um, detecting the uh, detecting any earthly interference or earthly uh, any um, atmospheric interference. So for example, on the bottom right here, um, we see that from both CAT and APF, there wasn't any um, toric emission lines, um, at least from at least from atmospheric or earthly interference. So yes, it's pretty much um, pretty much just shows um, absorption features that are supposed to that are supposed to be there. So sodium D uh, absorption features. Okay. All right. Cool. Thanks. All right. Uh, thanks, Malik. Um, Diana, can we get you to move around and uh, sit over here next to the, the mic? Maybe take uh, Malik. You can uh, scoot up. Maybe get here. <laughs> you don't need to move, Malik. You can slide down. Yeah. Oh, sorry.
All right, so hi everyone. Um, my name is Diana. I am a student at Harvard uh, studying computer science and astrophysics. Um, and this summer I worked with Dave McMahon and Daniel Sheff on a Julia data acquisition package for the hash pipe pipeline that runs on many of the telescopes that SETI uses. So essentially the hash pipe is a data processing pipeline um, where raw data from the telescope gets pushed in uh, and threads run various processes on the data before it gets written out. Now between the threads, there are these data buffers and their job is to share the data between the threads. So each thread has access to the data. Um, connected to all of these is the status buffer, uh, which is shared among all the threads uh, and contains basically the same fields as a header for a data file if anybody has ever seen uh, kind of the guppy raw headers. Uh, it contains the frequencies being observed, um, the time, uh, information about the instrument being used, uh, data, si data sizes, um, and so on. So why did we want to be able to access the hash pipe with Julia? Um, well, as many uh, previous um, presenters kind of pointed out, there is a massive amounts of data um, that SETI has to deal with. Um, and there, the hash pipe is no exception. So there are massive amounts of data flowing through it uh, and not everything gets stored. Uh, the data that does end up being stored takes a long time to access. And I put long in quotations here because I'm speaking relative to the data accessed through memory. So data in memory can actually be accessed about 10,000 times faster. Uh, so that's why we want direct access to the data buffers. Um, so Julia ends up being the perfect language to use for accessing this data because it works so much faster than other high level languages like Python. So with those goals in mind, this project culminated in a Julia package that we called HP Guppy DAC. Um, it's up on my GitHub now and the link is uh, on the slide here. So the package is divided into two main parts. There is a Hashpipe Utils module and a Hashpipe Apps module. So in the uh, Hashpipe Utils module, we have the kind of general functions um, that connect to the data and status buffers. Um, they read in the fields from the status buffer and they uh, track the data flowing through the data buffers. They calculate power, um, perform FFTs um, and initialize arrays. Um, and a lot of this module uh, relies on the hash pipe packages developed by Dave and Max Hawkins um, and C and Julia respectively. And I have the GitHub's linked there. Um, and then in hash pipe apps, um, we have the higher level functionality um, that is in HP Guppy DAC and a lot of the more interesting functions come from here. So this is where we have the uh, real time displays and plots. Uh, we have Redis integration, which I'll talk about a little bit later, and we have functions that perform real-time FFTs on the data. Great, so uh, Hashpipe Apps has all the kind of more interesting functions, I think, so I'll be focusing primarily on the functionality provided by that module. Um, so one thing that Hashpipe Apps provides is the ability to create real-time displays. Uh, and it was important that this, that this functionality was very flexible so that a user could create a display of anything they wanted. Um, this was done by creating a hierarchical structure where you have these things called snapshots um, that can be used to create displays uh, and GIFs. So a snapshot is simply a plotting function that produces a single graph of the data at the moment that it is run. Um, and these can be fairly easily specified by the user. Uh, and from there, it's possible to pass the snapshot to a display snapshot function, which will create a display. Um, and it's also possible to uh, pass the snapshot function to a GIF snapshot function, which will create a GIF. Uh, on the right here, I actually have an example of a GIF that was created uh, using this package. Um, and this will resemble kind of what a display looks like. So this shows kind of data flowing through the hash pipe on the computers here in Campbell Hall. So this data isn't real telescope data, but um, in the first polarization, uh, we have only noise, while the second polarization contains noise and a signal. 
Um, and this is where the other functions of the hash pipe apps kind of come in. So another function of hash pipe apps is these real-time FFTs. Um, and these can be used to search for signals um, in the data flowing through the hash pipe. So what this function does is it performs FFTs on each data block as it's being written. Uh, the cool thing about this function is that it will actually store data from a certain number of previous blocks uh, and integrate the data. And that's very useful when you're looking for weak signals to have data from a number of blocks. And that can be specified by the user of the package. Um, so after performing the FFT, the function then performs some other function that is also specified by the user. Uh, and that can range from storing the data, uh, displaying it. Um, it can also push to Redis directly um, or use some other function in the package or a function that the user kind of created uh, specifically for themselves. Uh, on the right here, uh, let me play this. Uh, on the right here, I have the same signal from the previous GIF I showed. Uh, and I just happen to know that the signal uh, was in the 46th course channel. So here you're looking at the first polarization and the second polarization. Um, and you see less variance just because you're integrating over several blocks. Um, but in the first polarization, you can see that it's just noise. And then in the second polarization, the signal kind of comes through uh, very strongly here. So the, the, this function also is really good for showing off Julia's speed uh, and performance. Um, so this function is actually able to perform the calculations on a block faster than the time it takes to, to write the block of data, which is about 0.2 seconds. Um, and this is great because it means that we're able to grab every single consecutive block, uh, no matter where we start. So the last thing that Hashpipe app supports is Redis integration. Um, and Redis is a fast NoSQL no database uh, that is conveniently supported by Julia. Uh, so this makes it a really great tool for collect collecting data uh, across compute nodes. So there are really two main Redis functions uh, in this package, one that is run on the compute nodes and one run that runs on the head nodes to kind of collect all the data from the compute nodes. So on the compute nodes, um, this push Redis function grabs data from the hash pipe. Uh, it performs any necessary computations. Um, it then converts uh, the data array into an abstract string, which is um, kind of what Redis needs to store. And then it pushes um, that abstract string to a channel in Redis under a certain key. And then once that's all done, um, the function actually publishes a message um, that the data is ready. So on the, on the head node then, um, the head node is actually subscribed to all of these messages. Uh, and as soon as it receives the message that the data is ready, uh, it performs some function. Uh, now this is very general. Um, so, and it's, it's specifically general because there's a lot of things that you cannot do once you have all of the data, data collected from the compute nodes. Um, so one option would, would be to um, use the display functions to display this. Um, you can also probably perform the FFTs on here um, or do something entirely different. Um, so it's really up to the user here. Uh, so this package is currently up on my GitHub already, uh, and it has a README, a tutorial, and some example files. Uh, however, there are definitely improvements uh, to be made um, to this package, and I just it, listed some of, several of them here. Uh, for one, the read FFT function does not integrate as well with the other functions of the, in the package as I'd like it to. Uh, I tried to make some improvements in the last week, but I definitely think there's some some more headway to make, be made in, the, in terms of design. Um, additionally, the plots that I have, as I have them now, um, if you saw, they have channels across the x-axis instead of frequencies. Um, and that should be fairly simple to implement. I just haven't gotten around to that. It, it would require reading the frequencies from the status buffer and then doing that conversion. The plotting and display functions could also use some improvements. So the snapshot function in particular, sometimes takes a while to uh, produce a plot. 
And just generally, it would be nice to have some more functionality. Um, more functions can always be uh, added to this module, to this package, um, and it would be great to uh, kind of have some input from others on what like what tools that they would like to see here. Um, so I just want to say thank you to my uh, mentors, David Mann and Daniel Sheck. Uh, thank you to Steve Croft uh, and the other interns. And then just generally thank you to uh, everyone at Berkeley Study and Breakthrough Listen. Thanks, Diana. Uh, any questions? Um, one question about performance. Um, did, you, did you have an opportunity to compare um, a C language based FFT function to the one that you were working with? Uh, no, I did not. It's using FFTW. I don't know whether you call that, Richard. It's using FFTW, Dave says. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, is there any um, opportunity in the future of leveraging the GPU? Uh, I'm not. I'm not too sure. <laughs> uh, possibly okay. there is uh, CUDA support in. in uh, There's CUDA support in Julia. I don't know what you for that. <laughs> so it's possible. Yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Diana. So if we can um, switch out the hot seat here. Uh, next up is Anna. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna, and I'm uh, going into my fourth year at Sacramento State, and I'm studying physics and astronomy. And so this summer, um, my project was on the drift rate analysis of detected signals of interest, and I was working with Dave DeBoer. And um, it was kind of based on work done by Shake It All and Smith It All, as well as um, code written by my mentor. Okay, so kind of some background and goals. So the goal for the summer was to help develop cold code that can be used to analyze um, signals of interest. Um, and to do this, it kind of, sorry. <laughs> um, so we wanted to check whether these signals may actually be extraterrestrial in origin and whether or not they could have originated from the source that lies in the direction in which it was observed. And um, the goal for this was to simplify kind of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And so to do this, I made some plots. Um, so those would show the overall shape of the signal based on two different models that I'm gonna kind of get into later, um, as well as kind of the drift of these signals to determine whether the drift of the signal agrees with what the drift would be due to the Earth's motion, um, as well as plots that help to visualize really how the location of both the observer and the source would affect the drift rate of the signal. So these would show the orbit and the rotation of the Earth at the specific time um, that the signal would be observed, as well as kind of where the star was on the sky. And so there are really two things that make a signal interesting. And so for the first one, as I think has been mentioned before, SETI us generally uses an on-off search cadence. So it spends a specific amount of time, say about five minutes, uh, pointing at um, a direction of the sky that we think is interesting. Um, for, for the purpose of the summer, I use Proxima Centauri. Um, and then say about five minutes at a different point on the sky, and then they move back and forth. And so really, the first thing that makes the signal interesting is if it's only present in the on observation time. Um, because if it's present in all, then it's likely a source of interference. Um, and if it's only present on source, then we know that it's directional. And then the second thing is looking at the drift. So um, there are some astrophysical things that could cause, that could kind of pass the first one, such as um, fast radio bursts 
or pulsars just kind of coincidentally, or also radio interference would also have a drift. Um, but if you find a signal that just happens to be directional, that's at a frequency that you know is allocated to a radio station, you'd just be like, okay. Um, and so there are several known causes of frequency drift. So the first is if the signal was actually extraterrestrial in origin, then drift would be caused by the motion of our solar system very center, um, as well as the motion of the Earth geocenter around the sun, so our, our orbit, um, and then the rotation of the Earth around its axis, specifically at the location where the signal was observed, as well as the motion of the signal source around its star and around its own axis. And then if the signal is man-made or RFI, then the drift would be from um, the emission of radio waves from earthbound objects in motion, such as um, phones or radios in or on cars or bicycles, um, transmissions to or from airplanes, satellites, or probes in motion, and then also the electronic oscillations of earthbound transmitters. And so now we're getting into the models that I mentioned before. So the first model is based on the assumption that one, the signal is actually extraterrestrial in origin and that it was intelligently sent. And also that it was sent specifically to our solar system, um, most generally the sun or the, or the Barry Center, which is about the same. And so based on these two assumptions, um, you make further assumptions that either the signal is stationary with respect to us or that they already corrected for their drift and that they also corrected for the drift of our Barry Center. Um, and so the plot on the left here would be a idealized really um, waterfall plot that we would see. And uh, you can see that it kind of looks different from what we've seen before. And this is because I really just set the noise to one value so that it's easier to see. And also I was having problems with the noise. Um, and then the one on the right is kind of the velocity of the frequency offset versus the time. Um, and it says the date, but it's in seconds. Um, and really a good thing uh, to plot this is to make sure that these two plots agree with each other. Um, and so you can see that everything's working how it should and to show really what the drift would look like. And then for the second model, we're making the assumptions again that the signal is actually extraterrestrial in origin and intelligently sent and that it was sent intentionally to the Earth. So again, we assume that they correct for their motion and the motion of the Barry Center, but also this time for the motion of the Geo Center. And so the only thing that would be left would be from the drift due to the rotation of the observer location from the rotation of the Earth. And so for this one, it's um, from Parks, which is in Australia. And so again, these are the same kind of two plots with the. Um, idealized waterfall plot and then kind of the drift. And then really the next thing that I wanted to show was how the drifts would change if we were looking from two different sources. Um, so for this one, I chose Deneb, which is in Cygnus, which is in a pretty far away from Proxima Centauri or Alpha Centauri. Um, and so you can see really just how these things change how the drift and the overall shape changes um, based on where in the sky the signal is located. And then finally, um, I wanted to kind of show from two different uh, locations. So I chose the Center for High Angular Resolution Astronomy Array, which is in California, which is obviously on the opposite really side of the Earth from Australia, which is where Parks is. And so this first plot here is kind of it shows the orbit of the Earth and then there's points at um, the two different solstices and two different equinoxes. So the one at the top, I put um, solstice in December. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, that'd be the winter solstice. And then they kind of go around and you can see that there's some little like lines here. And so I zoomed in on that and that's basically the rotation of the Earth at the time that um, was specified in the notebook, which is kind of when the signal was received. And you can see, so the gray lines are the um, rotation at parts. The black line is the rotation um, at, in, at the array in California. And you can see they're opposite because they're when one side's moving towards the sun, the other side's moving away. And then these next ones are again just the same two plots um, but for model one uh, the waterfall plot and then kind of the velocity versus time. 
And so the other things that this notebook do does is it basically functions as a write-up for everything I did this summer. So it contains a detailed walkthrough of the code as well and steps on how to create the files needed um, using JPL Horizon so that it can be used easily for any other study search. Um, it also provides a memo on coordinate systems and how to use AstroPy for drift ray analysis, which is essentially um, the background research that I did this summer. And so next steps would be to edit the notebook so it can be run independently. So right now it relies on two different files that were written by my mentor. Um, and we really want to get it to run independently. But I started to do that, but I didn't really have time. And then I mentioned this last week, but try to connect to JPL Horizons directly through the notebook instead of through a link. Um, and I tried Telnet Lib and that didn't work. And the next step would be Astro Query, but again, I didn't, I didn't have time to get to that. And then again, change the way the noise is added so that it would look more like a real signal. Right now it just shows the overall shape. And then in general, um, kind of just simplify again, the way that these other GIFs, um, we can analyze the, Drift to the other sources, which I mentioned before. Uh, and then thank you to all the other interns as well as my mentor and Breakthrough Listen and just Berkeley Study. Question? Great, thanks, Anna. Questions? Uh, um, do you take in your modeling, do you take into account like motion of like an exoplanet or other like an option of like? No, so that really I think is what Megan was doing this summer. <laughs> so we kind of are assuming that they already corrected for their own motion. Okay. We're just correcting for those two. Any other questions? Uh, okay, thanks, Anna. And uh, next up is Zeha. Can we move up into the hot seat? Okay, um, hi everyone. My name is Zihu and my project is this summer is generating synthetic dynamic spectra with generative adversarial networks. So in recent years, neural networks are used to search for signals from extraterrestrial intelligence, which are drifting narrowband signals in dynamic spectra, also called waterfall plots. On the bottom left is a real waterfall plot cadence of the observation from Voyager 1. So this is what a waterfall plot looks like in real life. Neural networks need a large amount of training data, which we don't have. Um, therefore, we need to generate our artificial data used for training. Now we're using the Citigen software uh, to generate waterfall plot. On the bottom right is a waterfall plot generated using the Citigen software. An idea that we propose is to use generative adversarial networks to generate our training data. So what are against? GANs are essentially two competing neural nets. The generator takes in random input and generates fake images as close to the real ones as possible. And the discriminator takes in the generated examples and real examples from our training data and determine if the image is real or fake. Both of the models are updated according to the results. We generate our training data for GAN using the Citigen software developed by Brian. On the left, we can see example data sets that are used for training. Noise level, drift rate, starting point, width, and types of signals must be specified by, by human input. However, GAN helps us generate without worrying so much about these parameters. 
I started my experiment using the traditional GAN. I trained the traditional GAN on the simple data set and the six type data set. The six type data set contains uh, the six type data set contains um, signals of six different drift rates and various starting points. The traditional GAN performs well on the simple data set. However, it fails to generate realistic signals for the six type data set. To solve this problem, we resort to conditional GAN. Using conditional GAN, we were able to generate even the six types of data and various and the various starting points. So what is conditional GAN? And how is that different from GAN? So basically, a conditional GAN takes into account not only the image, the waterfall plot, but also a label of the waterfall plot. So for example, for the six type data set, it assign a label to each of the six type of data and they generate and discriminate condition on that label. So it's basically like training six, training on six different simple data set. Here are some generate, generate, uh, generated data uh, using conditional GAN. Above are the uh, training data generated by Statigen. And we can see that the generated data are pretty realistic and various. Uh, for each of this uh, training process, 15,000 waterfall plots of size 128 squared were used for training. Each data set takes up, takes up around 1.5 gigabytes. The model is trained for 500 epochs, which takes around two hours on an NVIDIA V100 GPU. We're also curious if a little RFI affects the training of the generator. We simulate the RFI with um, this little vertical signals in the off observation. Um, the training data we used are half with RFI and half without RFI. The generated data doesn't have any RFI in the waterfall plot, which means that the generator was able to ignore the uh, RFIs that were inconsistent in the training data. So that's the generator. On the other hand, the discriminator can also be useful. In the network, we can see that the, uh, the, disc the train discriminator should be able to discriminate the real examples from the generated examples, which are essentially fake, exa e fake examples. So we propose the idea of using the discriminator as a classifier. We train our conditional GAN on potential ET signals generated uh, so that the discriminator will be, will be able to learn to classify images that look like ET signals to one and images that don't look like this to zero. We tested our uh, discriminator on the following four data sets noise background, cadence background, uh, regenerated training data, and RFI added to the training data. So ideally, the discriminator should classify the above two data sets to zero and uh, the uh, data set below to one. Here we show the distribution of the prediction score of the four data sets. From left to right, we have the distribution of the noise background, the cadence noise background, uh, the uh, cadence R RFI data set, and the regenerated training data stack on, stacked on top of each other. If we set the threshold to a little bit below 0 0.5, the, um, the classifier is able to, uh, the discriminator is able to classify uh, ET signals and non-ET waterfall plots. We also noticed that um, the regenerated training data and with uh, and training data with RFI added 
the distribution of these two data sets are pretty similar, which means that the, the, the discriminator is also able to um, is, is, is also able to ignore the RFI. Uh, so we conclude that our train generator was able to generate realistic waterfall plots with different signals, and our train discriminator is able to classify signals from different scenarios. For future works, we plan to apply the network to more variety of signals, um, test our discriminator on more realistic data. We also hope to explore conditional GAN with different astronomical data, such as light curves. Um, I would like to thank Berkeley SETI Research Center and Brick Solution for their support and uh, funding. Um, and sp a special thanks to my mentor, John, uh, Steve, and Yuhong for the fruitful discussions and all the BSRC researchers and interns. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Thanks. Any questions? Any questions? All right. Oh, thanks, Seha. Um, we'll move. Let's move on to uh, Joshua. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Joshua Bromley. I'm a rising sophomore at UC Berkeley, and my, I guess, spring and summer project simulating uh, occult structures. The motivation of this is that there could be an advanced extraterrestrial intelligence that would build a megastructure, so a large planet sized structure that would transit its host star. This, um, depending on the shape of the megastructure, this would produce a transit that would have a shape different than natural transits we observe from planets or comets and dust. And so, in order to identify such extraterrestrial intelligences, we would need to be able to differentiate between natural transits and these unnatural transits. And so, the goal of the project is to generate artificial transits to explore our capabilities for this differentiation and detection. So the first part of the project is generating light curves from certain occultures. So we would start by generating a shape, which is inspired by its Arnold paper in 2010, such as a long rectangle. And then we would then create a transit using the AFIT transit package, which is made by Sanford and Kipping. And that outputs a light curve that looks like this. And so you have no noise in this light curve, you only have the transit. And so after that, we would in insert it into a test light curve uh, to simulate it being a real observation instead of it being places. And so that then looks like this last image down here, where you can see it has noise and also additional uh, artifacts from the test, from test observation. And so the parameters we use were size and depth. Initially, we started out arbitrarily choosing a 1% dip and got smaller than that. Uh, also transit length, which we started at one day, I believe, and got smaller than that. Sides, such as three sides, so we range from three to six sides. Rotation, such as it facing the other way, and we did increments of, I think, 30 or 45 degrees. Depending. The data set stretch, which is the ratio, the height and width, and so you can see um, as the object gets wider, so we did uh, there, about twice as tall to half as tall from being uh, perfectly round. And the number of objects. So we also had a couple data sets where there are a couple objects in a row, ranging from, uh, well, one object to five or six. 
and then also increasing the separation of these objects so they get farther and farther apart until so that the transit is either entirely together to the point where the transit where the first object exits the transit before the last object exits. And so this is an example of a small section of the data set you can see that move there. So they're all triangles of about the same size and moving across left to right, they get. They start being taller than they are wide and they become wider than they are tall. And moving down, you see rotation. Um, you see clockwise rotation. And so these are the corresponding light curves to the objects that were on the previous screen. You can see that. Uh, the noise, the signal to noise ratios on these are different, and that is because we injected them into a variety of test curves, and so we get uh, so some test curves are noisier than others, and so the signal to noise ratio could be different. Also, you can see a couple of these have uh, data gaps, and that's because we chose to insert them uh, into random locations into the test curves, just like how real observations would be. The second part of this project is deriving the shape of an occulter from a light curve. And so doing this, we used a Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC sampler. And we used, uh, and we operated under the assumption that the occulter is fully opaque and also ellipsoidal in shape. And from that, we can determine the X and Y dimensions and also the length of the transit and the location of the transit in the light curve. And so what a Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler is, is basically from, uh, it creates a distribution of parameters to, uh, to fit a model to the data. And so it starts with a certain uh, choice of parameters and from that current position, it randomly chooses a new position based on where it is. And then if the new position fits the data better, it automatically accepts that new position and moves on. If the fit is worse, then there's a chance of accepting it depending on how worse it is. And so between randomly generating positions, and then it does this thousand times. So between randomly generating positions and also possibly accepting worse ones, it creates a distribution instead of finding the optimal parameters. And so these are the outputs you get when you run the markup chain Monte Carlo. And so you can see on the left here is the trace, which is the uh, the, its position over time. And you can see with the bottom two, the pixel speed and the reference time that it really uh, focuses in on what values, whereas the X and Y dimension, it has a bit of a range. And that's likely because our model has the X and Y dimensions being discrete. And so the model output in that entire range is still the same. And then on the right, you can see a corner plot. So that's just the distribution of each of the variables. And then and then the plots uh, have, or histograms of them, and the plots from the distribution of one variable against another. So the important one would be this one here, which is the X and Y dimensions compared against each other. As you can see, most of the time it thinks that the shape would be here, but some of the times it thinks it's a little uh, taller and skinnier and a little, sometimes it thinks, I think this is wider, just larger in both, both ways. And so from that, we can, from the direct output from the Markov chain Monte Carlo, we can relate that back uh, to the occultors. So we have the light curve. So we have the actual data we used in black, which is our simulated data from before. We have as close to a truth curve as we could get in blue under there. And then we have, I think, 400 of four, so about a tenth of the samples in plotted in orange. And as you can see, some of them a little higher, some of them a little lower, but it fits the data pretty well. As for this, we have what we use to generate the data. So this true shape of the equals on the right, and it's predicted shape of heat map of that. So the brighter orange means more of the samples had that location as being opaque, and then uh, dimmer orange means less of the samples had that. And so as you can see, we're still lacking a bit in making a good determination on whether this shape is tall and is wide or wider than this tall. And so the results from both projects, all transits with a significant depth, which we set up 1% arbitrarily were detected as anomalous, which is expected because in the entire test field, anything that like isn't flat is kind of gonna get flat. Uh, however, we need to do more statistics to uh, differentiate whether uh, these are natural or unnatural, whether we can see the difference between, say, a triangle transiting and a circle, which would be a planet. Uh, 
as for um, determining the shape of the occulters, it, it, uh, the Mon Markov chain Monte Carlo sampler can determine the correct size of the occulter and the length of the transit as well as its location in the transit. However, it cannot it cannot determine the uh, shape or the height to width ratio. And in addition, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel Giles, Emory Cody, and Steve Prop for the All right, thanks, Joshua. Questions? Yeah, questions for Joshua. So I was curious, um, you know, you have this uh, rectangle that's being reconstructed as a circle. Um, do you think it, the model is sort of preferring circles or? Uh... Uh, I think the main issue is that, well, a couple of things. One, uh... If you look here, uh, so the rectangle versus circle. Well, one of the things is that we set the model to use an ellipse. So it would be more circular. But the thing that makes the shape determination is the ingress and egress, which would be this area and this area. And as you can see, there are like three data points in each of them. And so it's really hard for it to make a good determination of the shape based on six data points total. I think the entire curve is 1,060. Right, but it's getting the size. Yeah, but it's getting the size correct. Okay, great. Any other questions for Josh? Uh, if not, then let's move on. And next up is Alex. And I guess Alex can probably stay where you are. Yeah, sure. It looks like it did here yeah, so good just to see. The screen just went blank when I tried to create <laughs> <laughs> um, All right, maybe come back to me in a minute. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh Barbara and uh, Barbara if you ready there either. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, hi everyone. I'm Barbara. I go to Smith. I'm a senior and I am studying physics and astronomy. My project is searching the study of ellipsoid with tests. And yeah. Okay, so for introduction and background, um, why wide field surveys increase the volume of data on stars and potential solar systems, which is really good for SETI, but it also means that we need new methods to filter this data in order to find, you know, the technosignature candidates that we want. Uh, it's like the needle in a haystack um, metaphor that a bunch of people have talked about. Um, and so the method that I'm using in my project is the SETI ellipsoid, which considers stars that have observed uh, common major scale galactic event. So it is a synchronized search rather than just a random search for technosignatures. Um, it's focused on bright and rare events and on the assumption that other civilizations will also be observing and potentially transmitting signals based on those events, wanting to like coordinate with us. Um, and this spatial coordination is done 
thinking about uh, the shape of an ellipsoid with the earth at one of the focuses and the event at the other. Uh, so to explain a little bit the ellipsoid geometry, we just, we have it here. This is from a paper, a uh, Lemeshaw paper, um, who I think is the first person who thought about this, probably not, but he wrote about it. And uh, we can see here that the ellipsoid is um, based on like the distance between the, the event in this case, SN1987A and a possible technosignature candidate, uh, plus the distance between that star and the earth minus the distance between the event and the earth. And so this will be constant for a specific time, which is how the coordination is done. And so the first thing we did was, or wanted to do and did, uh, was find a test continuous beam zone, which are the most observed stars by test. Uh, and we have a lot of data on that, so we care about like those stars because they're very well studied. We have a lot to, you know, a lot of data to look at. Uh, we also wanted to cross match this with Gaia distances and uh, use that to trace the ellipsoid. Uh, so the results that I have are first the continuous beam zone for the three cycles of observation the test has done, which are the plots that you see there, which a bunch of you have probably seen a bunch of, bunch of times already. Um, and I cross match that with the distances, which you can see is like the color bar on the right, and also with the observation times so that we know when to look at the ellipsoid, if that makes sense. Um, and then we ran the ellipsoid code, which uh, was like a collaboration between work that James had already done. And so we worked together and like put together this for the test uh, candidates specifically. And we found about 300 technosignature candidates for a 0.07 year margin, about 500 for a 0.1 year margin, and about 5,000 for a one year margin. And this is out of uh, close to 1,700 stars, sorry, not 17,000 stars in the continuous beam zone. Um, and just focusing more on uh, SN 1980, I don't know why there's a three there, sorry about that. It's 1987. Um, we have seven single signature candidates for a 0.1 year margin, which are the ones that you see here. They're all in the southern hemisphere. Uh, which is expected because that's where uh, as in 1987 happened. So we then looked at some of the light curves for those. Um, these are not normalized, which is why they're all, all over the place, um, but we have them. We're happy about that. They don't look very, um, there's nothing that stands out right now, but um, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, we still have a lot to do with this. Uh, we want to, you know, keep analyzing them. And so with that, I can just move on to conclusions and next steps. Uh, so just to conclude, we're happy about our CDV work and about how the code is running, what the code is doing. We do want to analyze further light curves from the supernova candidates, the 1987 supernova candidates. And we're also looking into refining the uncertainty calculations, both in the ellipsoid and the distances of those stars. And of course, look at candidates from other galactic events because we are also calculating for different events. So we are not really limited to SN 1987A. Um, and yeah, so thank you uh, to the Berkeley Study Research Center and Breakthrough Listen. Uh, thanks to my mentors, James Davenport and Sophia Shake, uh, Steve Croft too, and all of you, the Breakthrough was an insurance, and also my blueprint, who was a great second career advice whenever I needed to debug my code. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, great. Thanks. Any questions to Barbara? All right, if not, then uh, Alex, are you ready? Okay, ready. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's try to. Um, okay, let me minimize the zoom frame. All right, so you should be able to see this okay. Uh, hey everyone, my name is Alex Corsills, and uh, my project is on classifying test light curves of variable stars with machine learning. And so TESS, you know, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite, of course, its main goal is to search for exoplanets, but the light curves that it collects are also really useful for classifying variable stars, and that's what this project is about.
So first, I just want to get into real quick the basic idea behind how machine learning classification works for anyone unfamiliar. Uh, so you start with a classifier, which is just a model. Um, and in the beginning, it's, it does totally useless. It doesn't know anything. Um, but so what you can do is feed in labeled data. So for me, I'm using light curves and the labels are what variable star category they fall into. So I might feed the classifier a light curve and say, this is a eclipsing binary light curve, you know, feed it another one. This is a Cepheid variable light curve uh, and keep doing that. And if I do that for long enough with, this, with enough light curves for all the classes that I want it to be able to identify, then I have now have a trained model and I can then feed in unlabeled data, unlabeled light curves, and it can make predictions and we'll see how accurate they are. And depending on how the performance is, I might be satisfied with them or I might want to go back and uh, retrain it. So that's what I've been doing this summer. So I've been building and improving a machine learning classifier to automatically categorize stars into their respective variable star classes based on their test light curves. So this is a process that historically was done manually or just by eye by looking at the light curve. Because if you look at variable star light curves for long enough, you'll notice that different types of variable stars have different distinctive features that you can see in the light curve. Uh, so here's an example on the right. This is an eclipsing binary light curve. And you can tell because there's these two uh, differently, uh, different depth dips in the brightness that repeat periodically over time. And these are produced when one star passes in front of the other. And then the second star passes in front of the first one. Uh, of course, the problem with doing it this way and classifying everything by eye is that there's just so much data. And so that's why, you know, lately there's been a ton of people doing machine learning to try to automate this process. It does raise an interesting question, though, which is how do we find the really new, weird, or interesting things, which were usually found by just people looking at them, when there's too much data for people to look at all of it? And so that's where Daniel Giles, my mentor, his work comes in. He's working on an anomaly detection pipeline. And uh, he uses machine learning clustering to be able to feed in a ton of light curves into his model and have it pull out anything that's really strange. Uh, so it'll automatically identify whatever light curves are the most unusual out of everything it's seen so far. And so this could be things like rare uh, examples of rare variable star types. It could be completely new variable star types that we don't know anything about. It could be transiting megastructures built by extraterrestrial intelligence. And that's where the SETI relevance of this project comes in. But so really what we're trying to do is this two-pronged approach where you have his anomaly detection pipeline with just unsupervised learning, which you can feed a ton of light curves into, and it'll pull out the weirdest ones. And then those weird ones you can feed into a well-trained classifier, which is what I'm working on, supervised learning because the data has labels. And then that'll tell you, does the data fit into any known classes? And if the classifier is easily able to categorize it, then maybe it belongs in that class. But if it's really struggling and there's no class that a light curve seems to fit well in, maybe that's something you want to go back and observe again because there's something interesting going on. So this summer, I've been working on a reduced classification problem. So eventually, we want this classifier to be able to classify variable stars of all or many types. Uh, for now, it's feed in a light curve and is it an eclipsing binary or is it not an eclipsing binary? And we chose eclipsing binaries just because there's a lot of them that have been identified. So in terms of the data, I'm using about 2000 each of light curves of eclipsing binaries and then about 2000 of non-eclipsing binaries. And so these were identified by Kepler where the vetting actually was done by hand and they were classified just by eye. Um, so I took the test light curves corresponding to those um, Kepler stars and I filtered them so that they were all in the same test sector. I uh, filtered them so they had magnitudes between 10 and 15. And then I later on filtered them by the period of their orbits. Um, I restricted it to under 15 days. And that's because if you look on the right, a single test sector is 27 days of observation. So it's not that long. And a longer period eclipsing binary like this one, 36.6 days, this is an eclipsing binary, but based on its test light curve, you wouldn't know it because you can't even see a full period here. Uh, so there's no reason that a model would be able to uh, identify this as an eclipsing binary. So that's why I removed those later in the process. And then in terms of the featureization, um, featureizing is just how to take features that you would normally see by eye and convert them into numbers, which you can feed into a machine. And so I used the cesium Python library for that, which is designed to 
featureized time series data like Likers, and it's got a lot of pre-built features that you can just choose the best ones for your application. And so after I featureized all the data, I started actually fitting models. And so I used the scikit-learn machine learning library uh, in Python, and I fit three different types of classifiers over the course of summer. So they are support vector, random forest, and k-nearest neighbors classifiers. And if you want to know the details of how those work, you can ask me. Um, and then there's a few different performance metrics you can use to evaluate how well your models are doing. The chief one that I used is accuracy, which is just what fraction of your model's classifications are correct. Uh, but then there are some other ones like precision and recall, which can help you avoid uh, some pitfalls that using only accuracy will get you into. But so the, the workflow for training these models was basically start off with this five-fold cross-validation process which uh, is basically just a process that's standard in machine learning to avoid overfitting on the test set. And then search over a grid or a randomized search of hyperparameters. So hyperparameters, if you look in the top right here, are just any sort of parameters of your model that you can tweak yourself. Uh, and so here is an example grid that I searched through for my random forest classifier where I have these five different hyperparameters and then I specify a few different values to try for each. And then what it'll do is take every possible combination of these hyperparameters and fit one model with each one. And then I can take the best one and I actually log the performance metrics and everything I want to keep for that model to the software called Weights and Biases, which has a nice web interface for keeping track of all your models. So my results, uh, the first sort of generation of models that I fit all had a best classification accuracy of around 0.8. Uh, and I was able to improve that a little bit first by removing the long period eclipsing binaries that got it up to about 0.83. And then using a finer grained hyperparameter search, so trying out more combinations of parameters, got it up to about 0.84 to 0.85, which is where it is now. Um, the area under the ROC curve, that's another machine learning metric, which is good for uh, avoiding problems you can get with imbalanced data. So you can imagine if you have a thousand light curves that you feed in, and 900 of them are eclipsing binaries and only 100 aren't, your model might not actually know what an eclipsing binary looks like, but it can figure out that if it just guesses eclipsing binary when it's not sure, it'll do pretty well, but you don't want that. So area under the ROC curve, the ideal score would be one, um, and it won't get fooled by that kind of model. So it's good that this is high. On the right-hand side here, these are confusion matrices. And so they are a way to track how your model is performing in terms of true positives in the upper left, true negatives are in the up, uh, bottom right, and then this top number is the number of uh, false negatives, and the bottom left is false positives. And I include this because you can see the top graph here is from before I removed the long period eclipsing binaries, and then the bottom graph is after I removed them, and you can see there's a huge reduction in the number of false positives, which is the bottom left corner here, and the accuracy also goes up by about five points, so that's exciting. This is just a quick summary table of all the uh, hyperparameter sweeps uh, or searches that I did. And so you can see that the best one is this random forest classifier uh, with an accuracy of about 0.84 or 0.85. That said, though, there's a lot of room for improvement here. Uh, 0.85 is not really considered like a super impressive result in the machine learning world. Um, 0.95 would be a lot better. And so we have a few ideas on how to improve this. One of them that we're excited about is automated feature extraction using autoencoder. So autoencoders, this is just a diagram of sort of how they work, but they take in input and then they reduce it down to a smaller representation such that they can still reproduce as output something that's approximately whatever you put in. And that is basically the feature selection process in machine learning. And so you can use this to automatically extract features and now I'm no longer relying on whatever I think is a useful feature. Instead, I can teach this machine to pull out whatever's most relevant, which might be things that a human wouldn't even think of, and that could increase the classification accuracy. Uh, another thing is generating synthetic data. We're hoping to do that soon because there's a lot of variable star types that don't have a lot of examples out there. And so if you can generate synthetic data, which there are ways to do that fairly easily, then you can uh, improve the performance of your models a lot. And finally, just expanding uh, the input data to other sectors of the sky and other types of variable stores. So I just want to thank my mentors, Daniel, Anne Marie, and Steve. Um, thank you, Brian Powell and Ethan Cruz, because we used a lot of their data. And then uh, 
thank you to everyone else at Breakthrough Listen who was able to help me troubleshoot or solve problems along the way. And thank you to the National Science Foundation for the financial support. Uh, these are my references. And if you guys have any questions, let me know. All right. Thanks, Alex. Questions? All right, no questions. Uh, let's move on then to Megan. Okay, we good? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Megan. I'm going to be a senior at the University of California, San Diego. And this summer, my project was determining the drift rate distribution of exoplanets. My mentors are both here today, Dr. Sophia Sheik and Howard Isaacson. We're all best friends, and I'm very thankful for them. Just like these planets are best friends. So, oh. Um, I think the key to any good presentation is that everybody at least understands the title. So my goal for this talk is that everybody will leave the room knowing what my title means. And there are three main vocabulary words that you need to understand. So there's drift rate, distribution, and exoplanets. We'll start off with exoplanets. So does anybody recognize what is in this image? Solar system. Noah said it, it's the solar system. <laughs> So exoplanets are any planet that is not in the solar system, henceforth exo. So exoplanets are a relatively new study. They were first proposed in 1917, but the first exoplanet was first confirmed in 1992. And it boggles my mind that some people in this room were like fully functioning adults when we first started confirming exoplanets. Um, today we have about 4,500 confirmed exoplanets and they get added about once a week. So exoplanets are mostly in our Milky Way. And that's not to say that there aren't exoplanets in other galaxies just that it's much easier to find exoplanets that are close to us. So the ones that we can study and that we know a lot about are mostly in our galaxy, and they're actually mostly in this cone that's sort of shooting out of Earth. And that cone is thanks to Kepler, named after the planetary scientist Johannes Kepler. Kepler was a big exoplanet mission that launched in 2009, and it came out of space in maybe 2015 or 2016. It got replaced by its predecessor. No. <laughs> successor, thank you, K2. And today it's actually completely replaced by TESS, which a lot of people have been talking about today. Um, so TESS is sort of filling in all the gaps that Kepler left because Kepler was just viewing one cone. Um, so both Kepler and TESS discover exoplanets through transit. And I know a lot of other interns now are really wishing that I went before them because I'm going to talk about what this actually means. Um, so to be discovered by transit means that, um, we found this planet because it was passing in front of its host star. So if you're watching me through the Campbell Hall camera, we're going to pretend that this ball of socks is our star and this little foil ball is our planet. So if you're watching and you see that this planet is passing in front of the star, there's a period of time when the star is darker and then it becomes bright again. And then the planet passes, the planet passes and it's darker and so on and so forth. So when we start to notice that stars become dim periodically, that means that a planet is transiting in front of it and we found an exoplanet. So my data sample is from the NASA Exoplanet Archive and here's a really cool visualization of that. So you can see the cone that Kepler found and pretty much a lot of these other things are found from tests. Um, this is available, so I know how you'll all be spending your Friday night. You can click on each host star and see the actual planets that are orbiting them. And then you can see a visualization of what that planet might look like. So this is hat P21b. So we already know that these planets are orbiting their host stars. How exactly do they do that? Um, they use elliptical or Keplerian orbits. So they're not complete circles. There's some form of oval. And there's a lot to take in from these orbits. So some important things I've labeled here. Um, so the point where it's closest to the star is the periapsis. The point where it's farthest from the star is your apoapsis. And halfway in between those two points is your semi-major axis, which is essentially some metric of how big your orbit is. On the right side, we have all these very complicated angles. One of them that's interesting for us is inclination. 
So inclination is um, the green eye at the bottom. Imagine that you're sitting where the gamma is. So we'll pretend like this owl is the gamma again. So a planet that's moving like this, we will see transit. However, let's say it's inclined so that it's orbiting like this. Well, it's no longer transiting for us anymore. The star never becomes darker. So it's much harder for us to find planets that are orbiting with an inclination where it's not transiting in between us and them. Okay, so why am I at all important to the study search? Now we're gonna get into drift rates, also known as Doppler shift over time. So we've seen a lot of waterfall plots today or maps of frequencies of signals over time. Here's one on the left by Isaacson et al. It was a very star studded et al. that includes every scientist in this room. This is actually a signal from Voyager 2. So technically it is from an extraterrestrial intelligence, but we sent that out there, so it doesn't really count. So the drift rate for this signal is going to be the slope of this line, or Noah described it as the angle. And we actually deal with Doppler shift on Earth too. So how do you know if you're being chased by an emergency vehicle? The siren starts to sound higher and higher and higher. So this idea of you know, moving towards somebody or moving away from it um, can distort frequencies. And we know that these planets are moving towards and away from us because they're orbiting their star. Or let's say the transmitter is like sticking out of the planet as it moves around, it will also have a difference in distance. Um, and then there's the receiver that's also moving. So for us, our receiver is always going to be the Earth. We are rotating around the sun. The Earth is also rotating. Or let's say for some weird reason, the transmitter is like flying around. They really want it to accelerate. That is also going to cause a drift rate. Um, what's great about my project is that we are going to ignore everything that's not the first term. So the first term looks something like this. So our F dot is gonna be our actual drift rate. We have F rest, which is the frequency as that person is transmitting it. So the frequency that you would measure on that planet. Um, that is divided by the speed. That's just related to how we calculate Doppler shift. And then we have GM over R squared, our favorite Newton's law of gravitational acceleration. I hear some laughs. There's some like, you know, post-stress from physics class. And then our sign I or sign of our inclination, because it does matter whether or not we can see that planet. Um, it needs to be the distance from them to us as projected along our axis. And you'll notice that this F rest term, there's no way for us to like really know that. We don't know what somebody's trying to transmit. So even better, we're just going to get rid of that term completely. So here is our normalized drift rate. Um, and this is gonna be what I call a drift rate for the rest of this presentation. So it's just GM over CR squared by the sine of I. Cool, so what did my project actually do? First, I built the elliptical orbits of each of the exoplanets that you saw in the visualization earlier. And not all of those parameters are actually available. So I do have to sort of fill some of those in through physics. Um, and then I sample those positions because you'll notice that the equation that we have to use has an R in it, but nothing else. So we only need the position. So I sample those positions 200 times. Here's an example of one of the um, elliptical orbits that I built on the right side. And then from there, I can calculate the radial accelerations by plugging it into that formula. I just project those along the z-axis and I divide by the speed of light to get drift rates. Cool, so we're on to our last vocabulary word, distribution, why this is important and why I decided to graph this. So in 2019, my mentor, Dr. Sophia Sheikh, put bookends on predicted drift rates of exoplanets. So she said that basically all exoplanet drift rates should fall between plus and minus 200 nanohertz. So my job was to test this on a bigger sample because as I said, people are adding more exoplanets every day. So in the past two years, a lot of exoplanets have been added. So with the bigger sample, I also filled in the distribution of what is in between those bookends. And I was able to get this graph that you see on the right. So um, I decided to question how many planets would fall or how many drift rates would fall in between 99% of our measurements. And I got plus or minus 40 nanohertz. I always get questions about this y-axis. So there are about 80,000 values in here because out of the 4,000 planets, we took 200 samples each. Cool, so some bias that we mentioned earlier was that 
this data is heavily skewed towards planets that happen to transit that we can observe through transit. So you'll notice that um, in this pie chart over here, most of our planets were discovered by transit. So the inclination is slightly skewed so that we could see them. Um, and that is also visible in blue back here. If you're curious about Kepler, um, this green part of this pie chart shows how many of these planets were discovered by Kepler. And that's out of all the planets, not just the transiting ones. And then I also wanted to know which of these planets could actually house life. And my conditions for housing life were um, very lax. So first there was whether or not the planet was rocky, whether or not you could stand on it. It's not like a gaseous planet where aliens would just fall straight through. They're probably not sending us anything. So at the top right, we have possibly rocky or probably not rocky. So you'll see that the planets that could possibly be rocky are more towards the center. And then something I found really interesting was the habitable zone. And this is not literally the habitable zone. I had to simplify these calculations a lot. So these are planets that fall between 273 and 373 Kelvin. Those are displayed in blue in that like small needle in the histogram. And then the rest of the histogram is probably not habitable because they're really, really hot. Cool, so what am I going to do next? Um, that NASA Exoplanet Archive also has this cool page called weirdest planets. And I'm really interested in weird planets. So I wanted to have more ways to divide up that histogram in ways that are useful to either study or that are just interesting. So email me what kind of planets you like. There's my email. I'll divide up the histogram just for you. And you can find out what kinds of drift rates the planets you like have. And then um, pretty soon, I will be simulating a whole new population of exoplanets that adjust for some of those observational biases. Uh, unlike Zach, I didn't forget my weekly tradition. So here are my cats giving you a kiss goodbye as I also leave this program. Finally, thank you to my mentors, Dr. Sophia Sheikh and Howard. Thanks to Steve and Bridget Lipson and the NSF for funding. Thank All you. Right. Great, thanks, Megan. Questions? So I'll have you, you question the y-axis. I'll question, not question the x-axis, but um, you have it labeled as Hertz. Do you want to explain why it's Hertz and not Hertz per second? So Hertz versus Hertz per second comes from our equations here. So when I had divided it out by F rest, this is now in Hertz and no longer Hertz per second. So it's our, you know, kind of baby drift rate. Yeah, it's a normalized. Drift yeah. Rate. yeah. That one trips everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you go back to that the, 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 the two more? It's like the histogram in that one. Do you know why, uh, like, the habitable planets are like right around drift rate of zero. Yeah. So um, what Sophia and I have posited was that when you get closer to the star, like you're more affected by the gravity. So your drift rate is going to be higher. So these people who are more on the outside, not people, the planets who are more on the outside are probably really close to their stars. So they're just really hot. There's also biases in terms of when you sort of alluded to this in terms of how exoplanets are found and that it's sort of easier to see a big thing that's close into the star. And so, um, you know, those that sort of dominate the, well, I guess they don't dominate counts. You've got a bunch that are in, in the middle here, but, you know, in terms of those, uh, those ones that are further out than, or the further out in the drift rate, but closer in, <laughs> into the star, um, you know, those also tend to be the ones that were discovered earlier on um, in, in exoplanet research as well. Any other questions? All right, uh, thanks, Megan. Next up is Pranam. Share my screen. Give me a second. Okay, um, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, uh, hi, my name is Pranav Nagarajan. Uh, I'm a rising senior at UC Berkeley, uh, majoring in physics, astrophysics, and data science. And today I'm going to be discussing my work on the breakthrough listen periodic spectral signal search. So the motivation for my project is that different classes of technosignatures require different search strategies. And uh, in the past, searches have focused on narrowband signals that uh, drift due to relative motion between the source and the observer. Um, but broadband signals that have periodic spectral modulation are also promising indicators of extraterrestrial intelligence. 
Uh, in fact, such signals show up in human communication. So how do we search for such broadband signals? Well, in the past, we focused on using fast Fourier transform techniques, but such algorithms are impacted by random walk noise and tend to perform poorly on signals that have a short duty cycle or a long period. So are there any alternatives to FFT? Well, there are. Uh, introducing the folding algorithm. To understand the folding algorithm, let's say that we have an evenly sampled time series that has m cycles and p samples per cycle. Then our data can be represented as an m by p two-dimensional array. Now, let's say that our true signal in our data actually has a period that is slightly greater than p. Then it's going to look like it's drifting toward higher phase values over the course of our observation. Normally, phase folding would just require us to add up all of the rows in our data set. But now we have to account for this shift of S bin that the signal takes over the course of our observation. So what the folding algorithm does is that it tries out all of the different values of S uh, until we get a high integrated intensity to reconstruct our signal and determine what the correct period actually is. Now the fast folding algorithm is a divide and conquer algorithm essentially it splits the data set into a head and a tail and applies FFA recursively on each part. Then it applies the proper circular shift and adds those FFAs together to get the full folding transform. And uh, this algorithm is implemented in a fast way in the Riptide FFA package in Python developed by Morello et al, who in 2020 wrote a paper demonstrating that the FFA or fast folding algorithm has a superior performance to FFT in detecting signals especially in the regimes that I discussed before. So to test out this algorithm and provide a proof of concept of the analysis part of the pipeline that I'm developing, I first studied a pulsar. If we take this pulsar and feed it through Blimpy, we get the waterfall plot that you can see on the right. If I take a high quality frequency channel from that waterfall plot and then run that through the FFA analysis in Riptide, you get a periodogram that uh, you can see on the bottom or a periodogram resembling that. Now, if you take the highest peak in this periodogram and check what period it has, it turns out to be about 156.4 milliseconds, which essentially exactly matches the literature period for this pulsar. So hooray, it works. Now, what my pipeline does is that it actually analyzes every single good frequency channel in this waterfall plot using F of A. And if you do that, you'll get a two-dimensional plot where the frequency channel is on the y-axis and the periods are on the x-axis. And you basically take all of the peaks in the periodograms uh, of each uh, frequency channel that are above some signal to noise ratio cutoff. And when you do that, you immediately will see some vertical features and some horizontal features in this two-dimensional plot. The vertical features are periodicities that are shared across all frequency channels. And here we see the dominant such feature is the pulsar. You can also see several harmonics of this pulsation, which I've marked with a plus sign. Now the horizontal features are in specific frequency channels and are basically radio frequency interference that we're not as interested in. So the next thing that I thought about was, how do I identify and flag radio frequency interference? And to do that, you basically have to do on off comparison where an on file is a, a file where you're pointed straight at your source and an off file is where you're pointed at a background. And there are multiple ways to do this that I tested out. The first one is to take your waterfall spectrum and time average it. Then you cut it up into coarse 2.9 megahertz uh, windows and you compute the noise background in each of these windows. Then you look at the frequency channels in all of the windows and try to find frequency channels that have signals that are some level above the background. Now, if a frequency channel is flagged in both the on file and the off file, you know it pro it's probably R5. Another thing you can do is treat each frequency channel as a time distribution and compute the kurtosis of that distribution. And again, if a channel has a high kurtosis value in both the on file and the off file, it's probably R of five. Now, both of these methods uh, happen before the FFA analysis takes place in my pipeline. So they're pretty quick. Unfortunately, I figured out that they weren't really flagging all of the R of five that I wanted to flag. So in the end, I defaulted to the brute force method, which basically you run the FFA analysis on both the on file and any number of off files and look in that period frequency space and find points that match between the on file and the off file in order to flag them as R5 within some given tolerance, of course. So once I figured out the on off comparison, I also implemented a few other things. One thing that I checked was multiprocessing so that I could look at all, uh, all of these frequency channels essentially simultaneously. And after I did some benchmarking, I realized that for a five minute observation file, 
uh, actually analyzing it with the FFA typically takes about five minutes as well, which is good. Another thing that it did was implement a simulation option where you can inject a periodic signal into a file and then recover it for testing. Once I had fleshed out my pipeline, uh, I decided to focus on what are my deliverables for this project. The first one is going to be a two-dimensional frequency period plot that I mentioned before, where you mark both harmonics and RFI, as we will also see later. The second deliverable is that for each on file that you pass through this analysis, you will get an output text file. In the output text file, each row is a detected periodic signal. And each row has a lot of information about that signal. It's period, it's frequency channel, it's signal to noise ratio, it's bandwidth, and a lot of other useful information for researchers. Now, the last deliverable has to do with the fact that we normally don't analyze one on file and off file at a time. A typical cadence has six files, like on, off, on, off, on, off. And my pipeline can basically, uh, as I will, I will uh, soon discuss my pipeline further, will basically analyze that entire cadence and uh, concatenate the three output text files into a single text file and look at each unique detected periodic signal. And it will generate a six digit code for that signal that basically tells you is it present in each on file or off file. And it'll also give you a six by two plot. In the six by two plot, each row corresponds to each file in the cadence. The left-hand side column has all of the zoomed in periodograms at that particular periodicity that you're looking at. And the right-hand column has all of the corresponding folded profiles. So you can visually inspect them for uh, interesting signals and, and possible uh, ETI. So here's a flow chart that basically summarizes the entire pipeline that I was working on for a typical six file cadence. You can see in the upper flow chart that it's split into three for each on file. It passes through the uh, analysis script you get three output text files, which are then concatenated into a unique set. And the plotting script basically gives you your six by two plots and the, and the code. And the bottom uh, flow chart essentially focuses on what's going on inside bliss.py. You see that both the on file and off file are passed to Blimpy to get waterfall spectra, uh, which then uh, have each of their frequency channels converted to time series, which have FFA run on each time series. Then you get all the periodogram peaks that are above some cutoff. You detect the harmonics, do an on-off comparison, and write your output file and get your two-dimensional plot. So uh, to, uh, to basically show you how a six by two plot might typically look, here's a simulated data set uh, in which I injected a five second period. And uh, this is like an ideal world. You see like a sharp peak in the periodogram with a high signal to noise ratio that's detected in all three on files and is not present in any of the off files. And you see a corresponding peak in the, pro, in the folded profiles on the right-hand column. So this is an example of one six by two plot for one detected signal that you might get in a simulation. However, uh, you know, life is not always that ideal. And so what I next did, for, uh, or the final thing that I did was test my pipeline, pipeline on an actual six file cadence from the Breakthrough Listen Data Archive. And uh, you will get a two dimensional plot that looks like this. Uh, this is an example, this is for one of the on files. You can see that the RFI are all flagged with triangles kind of at some frequency channels uh, uh, at the bottom. And uh, you can also see some periodic signals at around eight seconds, 8.5 seconds, uh, something like that. And so if we then get a, a six by two plot for one of these uh, periodic signals, it'll look something like this. And you can see that it's a little bit hard to read the uh, Y axis on these plots, but the only periodogram that has a SNR ratios above 2.5 and the only spectrum that has a power that's above one is in the third on file. And uh, I have marked the detected period with a dashed line in the third on file, and it's about uh, around 8.5 seconds. And you can also see that the corresponding on spectrum does have a peak. And this is not present in any of the other on files or off files. And now compared to the previous spectrum that I showed you on the simulated data, you might realize that, uh, oh, the, I mean, these spectrums look really coarse. There's not a lot of bins, and it's true, there's not. And the reason is because the files that I was looking at in real life just didn't have a very high time resolution. So there's a limit on the minimum bin width that you can use. However, if you do uh, analyze files that have a, a better time resolution or a better sampling time, uh, then you can uh, really increase the number of bins in your folded profile. And that's just one of the options that are, that are in my plotting script. So uh, this is where my uh, project stands right now. But of course, there's many next steps that you can take. One thing that you could implement is the calculation of the peak signal to noise ratio in the folded profile. Another thing that you can do because we're looking at wide band signals is that you can do a clustering algorithm on that two dimensional plot that I was showing in the frequency period space to determine whether a signal is present in multiple neighboring frequency channels. And of course, the thing that you should do once this pipeline is complete is take the Bliss pipeline and apply it to large amounts of breakthrough listen data to see if we can find any indicators of extraterrestrial intelligence. 
Uh, and so all of my work and the documentation and plots and everything are in my uh, GitHub uh, under the SETI Bliss repository that you can uh, check out at convenience. Um, and yeah, so that's all I have. Uh, thanks uh, to my mentor, Vishal, and the entire SETI team for helping me with this project. And uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Pranav. Questions? All right, I guess the questions are sort of drying up as we get into towards the end of, of hour three here, but uh, the, thanks very much. Uh, two more talks left, um, so we'll move on to Iwe. Do you want to move around or think you're good? Speaker should have that towel right at. <laughs> So hi, my name is Eli Chai, and I'm going into my fourth year at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and I'm studying physics with a concentration in astrophysics. And this summer, my project was working on developing a new radio study pipeline for the Allen Telescope Array. Um, so just a bit of background, the Allen Telescope Array is a radio interferometer composed of 42 antennae, each 6.1 meters in diameter. It can cover frequencies from 1,000 to 1,500 megahertz and is currently operated by the SETI Institute at the Hack Creek Radio Observatory in California. The main science goal of the ATA is to search for techno signatures. And so currently the data processing backend of the ATA um, runs sort of like this. It'll take data from the antenna, um, process it through custom hardware to produce a raw file, which then is turned into a filter bank or HDF5 file, and then Turbo SETI is applied to that file. Um, just briefly, Turbo SETI is a tool which asynchronously looks for potential techno signatures. And at the moment, it can only really handle filter bank or HDF5 file formats. And this poses a problem for users without access to custom hardware, such as they have with the ATA. Um, my project seeks to ameliorate this by using GNU Radio, which is a free open source software for developing signal processing routines and is currently in use by a large community of amateur radio astronomers and enthusiasts. So the goal of my project was to implement a new radio study data processing pipeline in order to further the ATA's capability of performing techno signature searches, and then to use this pipeline to run observations with the ATA. This would ultimately make SETI more accessible to amateur radio astronomers and citizen scientists, as well as smaller radio observatories. Um, the outcomes of my project, as of now, are that I have created a pipeline flow graph in GNU Radio Companion, as well as developed an out-of-tree module for um, the new Radio Turbo SETI block. Um, I've also written a target selection script in order to determine a list of potential stars to observe with the ATA. So this is what the flow graph looks like. The main components, as you can see, are the data coming in through the USRP source and then being channelized to produce um, a high spectral resolution product using the polyphase channelizer and the post Fourier transform. Finally, the data is stored in a buffer for around 60 seconds before being passed to the Doppler finder block, which performs a turbo SETI analysis on the data. Um, one of the main challenges of this project was adapting Turbo SETI so that it could analyze data stored in RAM as opposed to a filter bank file. Um, and the way we did this was with a lot of help from Richard Elkins and Luigi Cruz. Um, basically, the key analytical function in Turbo SETI is find Doppler. And this reads in a header of metadata parameters from the filter bank or HDF5 file. For example, the number of fine channels, the first and last frequency, et cetera. It then maps these parameters to a data matrix and looks for narrowband signals drifting in frequency. So what we wanted was a new function to mimic this, but without first writing files to disk. And our solution was the imaginatively named Doppler finder um, in which the user will specify metadata parameters in Pinot Radio Companion. And then Doppler finder will then map these 
user specified parameters into an incoming data matrix. And so by doing this, we can achieve sort of synchronous analysis on small observation lengths. And as you can see, this is a simulated um, techno signature, which we ran through Doppler Finder and it was able to output um, a hit. So the second challenge was to shape the data matrix. And my first approach was to use an external buffer in which I created a Doppler Finder buffer block and then a Doppler Finder block, which did the Turbo SETI analysis. The Doppler Finder block was successfully able to output the dot files, but the buffer block would send incorrect data. So my second approach was to make use of new radio's internal buffer um, and sort of use multiprocessing to buffer the data coming in as a vector until it achieved the correct shape and then pass that to the Doppler Finder function. Um, so this is kind of what the updated flow graph would look like. Currently, there are still some issues that need to be fixed with the Doppler Finder sync block. Um, so my next steps would be to fix those and optionally also create a way of automatic plotting of dynamic spectra of hits. And then following that, I would like to begin ADA observation of target stars using Python. Um, I wanted to thank Luigi and Richard for their work on developing Turbo SETI stream, as well as Luigi's help with structuring the polyphase filter bank and the FFT components of the flow graph. And thanks also to Daniel and Derek for answering many of my questions about using Canoe Radio. Um, and lastly, thanks to my mentor, Wow. Questions? Thanks. Questions? Um, did you ever find out why the external buffer was put that wrong dude? Um, I think it's because it wasn't able to, so the way the flow graph works um, is that it, the, at the complex to mag point, it will send a vector of size of like a million samples into the Doppler finder buffer block. But the problem is the buffer block would only see that one um, vector as opposed to running 60 times and collecting 60 vectors to put it into a data matrix. So it's just sending that one vector repeated 60 times. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, if not, then uh, our last talk of the morning is that way. Yeah, you want to move up here by the, the owl gaze into its eyes. And should I not unmute it? Yeah, just the um, hi, everyone. My name is Zoe. Um, I am a rising third year here at UC Berkeley studying astrophysics and data science. Um, sorry, I couldn't make it to the um, presentations earlier this morning, but I know y'all have been working on some incredible projects. Um, so over the summer, my project was on the search for laser emission lines with the automated planet finder. Um, so so laser signals are a promising form of extraterrestrial communication because they offer both high privacy and high intensity. So my goal was to develop a laser detection algorithm and run it through all the spectra we have from the automated planet finder, identifying all potential laser emission lines. So this is an example of the data that we received from the APF. Um, and what a laser emission line would look like is a sharp, narrow spike that rises above the rest of the data. So kind of the way I ran through my algorithm was I first established a threshold. Um, so that's that horizontal gray line there. And I marked all the pixels that rose above that threshold. So all those vertical dashed lines, um, those are potential hits. And next, I would zoom into each of those detections. So zooming into the leftmost hit, um, I get this. And what I do next is I fit a Gaussian to that detection. And um, the idea behind that is every single signal that passes through the telescope will be smeared out by the telescope's point spread function, 
into a Gaussian shape. And um, essentially the APF has a point spread function of 2.7 pixels. So anything that is narrower than 2.7 pixels means that it didn't actually pass through the optics of the telescope. Um, it's likely something like a cosmic ray hit. So I fit a Gaussian to um, this signal and I test first to see if it's Gaussian-like. And I do that with a chi-squared test. And in this case, the signal passes um, with this low chi-squared value. And next, I want to find the full width half max of this Gauss fitted Gaussian. And I want to see if that's greater than 2.7 pixels. So in this case, this is 2.4 pixels. And that signal fails. And it's kind of disregarded. So that very first leftmost signal doesn't pass. And so I move on to my next one. And I basically iterate through all these potential detections and then iterate through all my spectra. But before I start running this on actual data, um, I first ran a signal injection and recovery test. So essentially I took 2000 random spectra from the APF and in each one I randomly injected five signals. Um, and I would just run my laser detection algorithm on it to see if I was able to recover all those artificially injected signals. And this is just an example of a signal that I've injected and a Gaussian fitted over it. So these are my results. Um, this, uh, this vertical line here represents the signal width threshold. So that um, point spread function of 2.7 pixels. So essentially, I only want to be detecting anything that is wider than 2.7 pixels or to the right of this vertical line. Um, this horizontal line represents the maximum threshold. So I only want to be detecting signals that are stronger in flux um, than this threshold. So everything above this uh, horizontal line. So like expected, everything down here in this region, I have a 0% recovery rate. Um, so I don't want to be detecting anything here. And in this top right region, I have a 100% recovery rate, which is also as expected. So I'm recovering everything that I, I want to that I artificially injected in. Um, it's this top left region that's a bit strange. So I expected this to be 0% recovery because as you can tell, um, these widths are narrower than 2.7 pixels and therefore should not be detected. Um, but basically what's happening here is I fit a Gaussian to each one of my signals and this Gaussian fit isn't perfect. So in some cases, it overestimates the width of my signal. So that's why 30% are still being recovered. So after um, I did my signal injection and recovery and figured out exactly what my algorithm is doing, how it works, I started running it on my actual data. So going back to that very first step of establishing a threshold and identifying all the pixels that rise above this threshold. So the way I determined my threshold is this equation m times n, where m is the average flux value of the pixels that rise above the continuum level, and n is a value 1.05 that I set arbitrarily. So over here, this um, purple horizontal line is m, but if I use m as my threshold, it would just pick up on a ton of noise and just give me a ton of hits. So I arbitrarily increase this by 5%. That's the gray line above that purple line you see here. And that's how, um, that's what my threshold is. So I ran this on all my data. That's um, a total of 5,800 spectra that correspond to um, around 850 unique stars. And um, this is just a distribution of how many detections I'm getting per star. Um, and this is for one individual spectrum um, or one spectrum for each star. So as you can see, most of the spectra have less than five detections. Um, so that's pretty easy to go through visually and understand. Um, however, some of the spectra have zero detections. Some have a crazy number like 700, 800. And so I looked a little bit more into that. So the top example is one of these spectra that have zero detections. And the bottom is an example of a spectra that has, I think, 700 detections. So for the top one, it seems like it's very, so this is high signal to noise data, that top one. And it seems like I can push that detection threshold a little bit lower, um, increase my sensitivity. Whereas the bottom one, that's very low signal to noise. So very noisy data. And it seems like I'm just picking up on a ton of noise. So um, it looks like I should be raising my detection threshold. So decreasing sensitivity. And if you look at the relationship between the signal to noise ratio of my spectra and the number of detections, 
there's a pretty strong correlation. So very noisy data. Um, so very low signal to noise ratio on the left side. Those spectra are getting a ton of detection. So up to 800 detections. Whereas the very clean data, um, high signal to noise ratio on the right side of this plot, um, those are getting very, a very low number of detections. And even though we don't have any priors on where we should be finding laser signals, um, there isn't really an astrophysical reason as to why the number of detections should vary with signal to noise. And so essentially, I don't want this strong correlation here. So what I did was instead of defining, instead of setting n arbitrarily to 1.05, I let n vary with signal to noise. So for very, very clean data, high signal to noise, I increase the sensitivity by pushing down that threshold um, and setting n to 1.02. For very noisy data, so low signal to noise ratio, um, I, increased, um, I increased my threshold um, bringing n up to 1.13. And this is what I got. So on the leftmost region, th that's my really noisy data, low signal to noise ratio. Um, and because I decreased the sensitivity there, um, I'm not getting all those crazy 800, 700 detections and that lower down to 400. Um, on the right side, that yellowish region, um, that's my very clean data. And I increased my sensitivity there. So instead of just getting a bunch of zero detections, I'm actually picking up on some more detections there. Um, however, as you can tell, there still is a correlation here. And um, there shouldn't, just astrophysically speaking, there shouldn't be a correlation between signal to noise ratio or number of detections. So for future steps, what I can do is have n be a function of signal to noise ratio. Or I can set the threshold for every spectrum such that 10% of that spectrum's pixels will exceed the threshold. So there's more uniformity there. Now, looking at the actual detections, so I pulled out some of the highest signal to noise ratio spectra with a few number of detections so I could inspect them by eye. Um, these are just some of the detections that I'm getting. So the top is the spectrum. Uh, and the bottom um, are the signals that my algorithm is outputting saying these are potential uh, laser line emissions. And here are some more as well. So moving forward, um, I want to classify every detection and narrow it down to a pool of unexplained emission lines. So right now there is around 245,000 detections out of these 5,800 spectra that my algorithm is outputting and that's a lot. So. My goal is to classify every single one of those detections um, down to astrophysical or terrestrial sources and narrow down um, that pool to um, a small number of unexplained lines. Um, I also want to take a look at the 2D spectra, as Steve always recommends. Um, right now, I'm only looking at the 1D spectra, and there is still a lot more to be um, inspected with those 2D spectra. Um, I can also run the detection algorithm on the residuals of my spectra instead of um, the, the data with all the absorption lines. And hopefully by the end of this, I'll find some aliens. And um, thank you to Howard for guiding me along this project. Thank you to Steve. Thank you to all the interns and everyone in this room. Um, and yeah, um, any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so because um, lasers have like low diffraction, they're very narrow, they have like a very narrow beam, and so it's less likely to spread out and um, that prevents things like eavesdropping. So when you zoom in on like your detections, how, how do you pick apart like aliens from like noise? So that's a great question. So if you see this um, bottom plot over here, um, we sort of have to sacrifice some data because let's say there were some laser emission lines that were mixed in with these noise. We're unable to separate that or pull that apart from the noise. So what I have to do is essentially set a threshold that is generally above the noise and only pick out those uh, signals that rise above the noise. Any other questions?
Right, well, if not, uh, I think um, aiming to find aliens is a good note to, to end on. Um, and thank you all for your efforts this summer and helping us in that endeavor and in all the other kind of fun techniques and um, uh, analyses that we've we've done along the way. No aliens yet, but, but stay tuned, uh, I guess. Um, so uh, thank you very much to everyone who, who's called in um, online as well, particularly for those of you who've helped mentor our interns this summer. Uh, and a few of you got shout outs uh, during some of the talks, but it really means a lot to have the community interested in what uh, we're doing here and what our interns are doing. Um, I'm hoping that a lot of our interns will continue to hang out on Slack. And if you have other questions for them uh, that come back to the talks that you'll be able to uh, ask them there. Um, I've also got a, a video of the talks today that I'll post um, uh, when when that's downloaded. Um, so for those of you online, um, I'm going to stop the, um, the the sharing now. But uh, thanks very much, and uh, have a great day. <laughs>